Do you remember those nightmares from when you were a kid? No more than seven, eight, maybe more? The ones that would jolt you awake, sweating in your sheets. I do. Mine was where I was this investigator, investigating this case where a girl had gone missing. I tracked it down to a family basement, where I discovered a doll that looked exactly like her, inside a coffin, where she was stuffed inside, dead. Then I was locked in the basement in the dark, left to face the doll alone, and the doll would always rise up, the corpse within it cracking and making these moist, fleshy sounds. I would always wake up after that. But I'm not here to talk about her. No, I'm here to talk about someone... something far worse and stranger. I'm here to talk about a woman who lives lived across the street. A woman who now is haunting my life. I first met her a few years ago. I'd recently moved into the house, which I shared with some roommates, and I'd only been on the street having a walk when she approached me. You're the new girl, she said, tapping me on the shoulder. Uh, yeah, I replied. Tiffany Hydrangea just moved. I turned and pointed at the house, right over there. I'm Janice. Janice Commonwealth, she introduced. She was a typical old grandma-esque person with a flower-patterned dress and flowing white hair. I live in the cottage around the bend, near the lake. Come visit sometime. I'll bake you cookies or something. Think of it as a welcome to the neighborhood gift. Thank you, I replied. But you don't have to. I'm sure I can... No, no, I insist. And so, next week I went over and was treated to some of the best cookies I'd ever tasted. They were soft, sweet like honey, and were studded in a nut I've never been able to really find. And then I came over another week, then another, and another. Very soon, it was more part of my schedule. I'd go over every other week, talk about my life, where I'd worked for a company that had something to do with old relics, and she told me about new ideas for her cookies. And then, she vanished. A month ago, she disappeared. I went over as usual and nobody answered the door, even after I'd knocked five or so times. Usually, she'd be quick to answer or she'd yell something. Miss Commonwealth? I yelled. No answer. I feared for the worst. I tried the door handle. It shook open, turning, and I pushed it, opening the door. It was odd. She'd never had the door unlocked, ever, even when I was visiting. The first thing I noticed was the scent of tea and cookies. That, at least, was normal, but not anything else. Hello? I asked, searching. Miss Commonwealth? All I got was silence. I went over to the kitchen. Perhaps she'd been caught up in baking or something, but still. Nothing. The kitchen was empty, void, except for cakes of tea laid out on the dining room table, and still baking cookies in the oven. It was as if she'd vanished, just as she was about to answer the door. But then, why had the door been unlocked? I continued my search, all over the house, but still, I didn't find her. Suddenly, just as I reached a bedroom, I heard something. A rustle of leaves outside, and I turned, fast as lightning, towards the window. I saw a blur, like an animal moving rapidly, but it didn't look like any animal I'd known. I called the police after that, and I waited for them to arrive. That's when I got the phone call. It was Mrs. Commonwealth, except for some reason my phone displayed her as an unknown caller. That had never happened before. The profile picture was the same, but still, the name itself was unknown caller. Mrs. Commonwealth, I answered. Where are you? Silence. I asked again. Silence. I began to ask again, but before I could, I heard her deep breathing, panting, as if she was being hunted. Hello? I'm lost. I don't know where I am. Can you find me? Mrs. Commonwealth, can you describe where you are? I panicked. The... 
Static poured in. And I yelped, pushing the phone away from my ear. Walls are so bright. My god, it's coming. The walls, it's like clay. I... Static over again poured into my ears, and then... Silence. Hello? I insisted. Mrs. Commonwealth? Then there was the breathing. Her breathing, but it was like she was far away, too far away. And it was as if her voice had been copied a hundred times over, then played back. The breathing got louder, 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 until... We're sorry, but this number isn't available. A monotonic, computered voice rang out. I looked at the screen. It was showing an error message telling me that the number didn't exist. What the heck? I murmured, tapping several buttons, then calling the number again. It rang, but nobody picked up. I tried again and again, right up until the police finally arrived. I told them everything. She vanished, as if she was about to welcome me in, but then disappeared. I told them about the phone call, and they said they'd look into it. In the end, I think they decided she'd gotten lost somewhere, somehow, and told me that she'd probably be back. She didn't come back. I waited hours until the sunset and the moon rose, yet... Nothing. I thought about calling the police, and then, and then decided against it. Maybe, I had thought, they were right after all. Maybe she'd come back later. So I returned back to my house, ignored my roommate's questions about where I'd been all day, and willed myself to sleep. And then I woke up. Two in the morning, my phone was ringing, blasting this tune I hadn't heard in years, it was old, and one I vaguely recognized to be from some obscure 80s artist. I rubbed my eyes, then checked in onto my phone. Unknown number, I murmured, just before my eyes focused and saw the profile picture. This is Commonwealth. What the heck? I tapped the answer button, and I was greeted by heavy breathing. It was farther away than last time. It seemed thicker somehow, as if it had been processed through a filter, yet it seemed real still and organic. Mrs. Commonwealth? Hello? I'm sorry, I don't know where I am. Can you find me? The heck? That's what she said before. No, not just what she said before, but exactly what she said before. The inflection, the voice, everything was exactly the same. Was I too confused to answer? And before I could even think of one, she said it again. Hello? I'm sorry, I don't know where I am. Can you find me? Can you tell me what it looks like? I managed to stutter. I'm gonna call the police. Hello? I'm lost. I don't know where I am. Can you find me? The voice repeated. Where are you? I pressed. No answer. Hello? Silence. And then suddenly. I'm outside. Can you let me in? But but it was it was wrong. It just wasn't right. It it was like that monotonal voice dictating the error. It was computerized, processed, inorganic. Can you let me in? What do you mean? I continued. I don't... We're sorry. But the number... I swore. Throwing the phone across the room, crashing into the window, where it bounced off, landing on my bed. Wait, the window. There was someone outside in the cul-de-sac it viewed over. Someone was trailing long white hair in a flower-decorated dress. That's, I gasped, impossible. It was Mrs. Commonwealth standing, looking away from the house, facing a tree, her face but inches away from it. Something, something wasn't right about how she looked, though. I went up to the glass to see closer, and suddenly I realized the flowers on her dress were wrong. I, I distinctly remember her saying how she'd always wished she could have tulips on a dress, and how she could never find any, and this... This woman outside my house had tulips on her dress. But apart from that, she looked almost the same. Suddenly I heard a noise coming from the palms of my hands. The phone had somehow turned on. It was nothing on it but a photo of this hallway, and no matter, no matter what I did, it stayed the same. And then came the voice. Can you let me in? It was the exact same as before. Across the street in the cul-de-sac, Mrs. Commonwealth, or whatever was outside, 
moved its jaw up and down as if it were speaking. It's so cold out here. The rooms, they were so cold too. Cold as clay. The woman outside continued speaking. The voice emanating from my phone. Please let me in. You're not her. Who are you? What's going on? Hello? I'm lost. I don't know where I am. Can you find me? And then the woman outside began to turn around, and before I could see her face, I... I fainted. I don't know what happened in the hours after that, but the next thing I knew, my roommates were around me, shaking me awake. Uh, what? What? Dude, what happened? Said a voice behind me. Huh? I asked, confused. Magnus, what do you mean? Dude, look around you! And I did. What the heck? I was at the dining table. There was a box of cereal in front of me, and there was a bowl filled with milk. No, not milk. Instead, there was a creamy substance. I poked at it with a spoon and found it to be... chunky. I suddenly realized what it was. Clay? What the heck? What happened? I demanded, looking back up at my roommates. We found you like this? One of them said. I woke up and I heard a noise in the kitchen, like someone was looking for something. I went out, I found you, except you didn't act like... you. I tried to ask you what you were doing, but you didn't explain. Then you got clay from the arts and crafts bucket, and you started mixing it with milk. You poured it in, and then I tried to stop you. I... I, I, I don't... remember. I looked around the kitchen. Sure enough, it looked like someone had been there. What happened next? You were able to push me off, so I went to get the others to help. When I got back, you had a bowl filled with... clay and milk. You're about to pour cereal into it, so we stopped you. I, I don't... I don't understand, I stammered. What about outside? Did you, did you see her? Mrs. Commonwealth. What are you talking about? The man known as Stephen questioned. I didn't see anything. I got up, I looked around, then retrieved my phone from Andrea who had it in her hands. I checked the CCTV app. It should view here, or around here. What are you doing? I ignored Andrea. The camera didn't show anything. No, no strange woman? Nothing. I mean, this didn't make sense. I checked the call app. No calls were made. Not even a scam call. But to my further confusion, the internal camera caught me causing a mess in the kitchen and making the food. I don't, I don't understand, I muttered. We don't either, Andrea said. Let's go to a doctor. We drove to the hospital, and within minutes, a doctor was checking me out. They scanned me, poked and prodded, but couldn't come up with a better reason than I was sleepwalking. Weirdly, my friends seemed to agree I was sleepwalking. However, the doctor decided... I should stay in one of the hospital rooms for the rest of the night, and so I complied. Well, I tried. The doctors were taking me to the observation room when I caught sight of something out of the corner of my eye. No. Someone. Someone wearing a flower-covered dress, and... I broke free of the doctor's grip and ran over to them. They looked back, revealing the face of Mrs. Commonwealth, and I ran after them. The doctors behind me chased me, but I was faster, and somehow the old lady, or, or whatever it was, was faster, and suddenly it was as if they were in another place, a hallway, alone. The lights were bright, the walls clear white and manila. I felt a sinking feeling, then looked down to see... clay. The floor was made of wet clay, clay that I was now sinking into. Hello? Mrs. Commonwealth? Hello? I'm lost. I don't know where I am. Can you find me? A voice behind me asked. I turned around to see. No. No, it wasn't Mrs. Commonwealth. It was... It was something else. I had turned around to see me. 
my face on the body of Mrs. Commonwealth. It mirrored my face. Every look, every blink, every gasp. Everything here is as cold as clay. The thing stepped closer, and I stepped back, feeling myself sink into the ground as I stepped. I stumbled, and I fell to the ground. Next thing I knew, I was inside the hospital, the normal one, and the doctors were all around me. Apparently, I, I tried to run, and I suddenly fainted. And so I agreed to be monitored for a week. And for a week, nothing happened. I mulled around, being observed by doctors, no sleepwalking, no illness, no creepy disease. So I was dismissed. Some sort of momentary hysteria, they called it. Nothing to worry about. And for the next month, nothing else happened. The police filed a formal investigation into the whereabouts of Mrs. Janice Commonwealth, but they weren't able to locate her. Nobody was looking for her anyway. I guess that's the price to pay when you're old. This also meant the police gave up after a week or so and just claimed that she probably decided to vanish on her own. After all, disappearing isn't a crime. It all got worse, though. I thought I was fine. I wasn't. She appeared again outside the house facing it. She spoke the same words again, just as my phone buzzed to life, the voice projecting all the way into it. I stayed up that entire night watching her stare up at me from across the street, drilling holes into my soul. When the sun set, I felt the urge to sleep. And before I knew it, I was asleep. She wasn't there when I woke up. Then the second night, I couldn't find her. Not at first, it was... It was only after I noticed something odd. She wasn't near the tree. She was closer this time. Just to the end of the sidewalk, meters away from the door. Again, like before, she didn't move. She just stared directly at me until the sun rose. Then I slept. And now, yesterday... Yesterday, she's inside the house. Outside my door. I didn't see her outside. I didn't even consider that she was inside the house until I heard it. Hello? I'm lost. I don't know where I am. Can you find me? I'm not sure what'll happen if she gets in. I'm not sure what happened to her. All I know is that I want it to stop. So if you know anything about what could have happened to Mrs. Commonwealth, I need to know. This is not an easy story to tell. Just thinking about what happened still gives me chills. Lately, I've been seeing a therapist to talk about what I saw, about what lives amongst us humans. It lives within the deepest depths of the ocean. However, he never seems to believe me. He tends to blame everything I saw in my trauma and tells me that, that my mind is making up these thoughts that aren't truly real. I'm writing this now in hopes that you, that whoever you are, will believe my story. Here it is. I've been working as a marine biologist for quite some time. A few years, to say the least. I used to love everything about the ocean, and was so mesmerized by it all. The glistening water, the plants, the sea life. Even the size was all the more reason on why I became a marine biologist. It was the middle of October, and a higher up from my research team gave me a call about a new unexplored region, somewhere off the coast of the Pacific. Now you may think somewhere so far out in the ocean may have made me decline the decision to go and explore such vast open areas, but no. In fact, just the thought of the idea made me ecstatic. I accepted the offer, I made the arrangements, and I quickly set off. The research team consisted of four people, Mike, Liz, my best friend Jackson, and myself. Together we've explored all kinds of places, discovered the most bizarre set of animal life, and even became the first group to do a deep sea dive inside the Mariana Trench. We were truly a fierce team, and every dive we took, every exploration that we've set out on, it was all done with little to no fear. I always have been fond of the ocean, yeah, but 
I can't recall a time where I was actually scared of it. That is, up until now. We set off early morning, wasting no time at all to get to our destination. So, so what do you think is out there? Don't know. New species, maybe? Mike and Liz loved to discover new types of animals, while me and Jackson were more fond of the plant life. <laughs> if so, let's hope nothing big enough to eat us, says Jackson, approaching the side of the boat. He gazed out at the open body of water, watching the city slowly disappear from our view. He closed his eyes and inhaled deeply. Ah, uh, smell that? Fresh air of... Open adventures, said our captain, cutting off Jackson as he spoke. Now let's not try to be out here for too long, understand? It's an area that we don't know of. We all agreed, began making plans on what specific things to keep an eye on. Well, being so far out, there's obviously not going to be any type of ground level whatsoever, and chances of us even getting an inch close to it is very slim. Mike's right. We should have the two of us search for unknown species near the surface and the other two explore deeper, says Jackson, caressing the lining of his jaw as a sign of thought. It was no surprise that Mike and Liz would be together. They were practically partners in crime. How about me and Jackson dive down? Evan and Liz, you guys stay at the top. It was surprising to all of us. How about me and Jackson dive down? Evan and Liz, you guys stay at the top. This was surprising to all of us. Why the sudden change? I questioned, glancing over at Liz. I don't know. Just thought we'd swap our partners for once, yeah? Jackson put his hand on my shoulder. Idiot. We're all partners here, but I guess switching it up a bit wouldn't hurt. Liz approached me with a cheerful look. Then it settled. Let's make this a great expedition. Time went by pretty fast, and it was finally time for us to take our dive. As I approached the deck, Mike and Liz already had their gear on, and Jackson was just about to dive in. Come on, hurry up! Put that last little bit of gear on, let's go! Mike sounded so excited. More than usual, in fact. Yeah, yeah, just give me a sec. After finally putting on the last bit, I hurried over to the side of the boat. Jackson and Mike dropped down first, then Liz. However, before I could get my chance to touch the water, our captain rushed out. Pick up signs of a storm on the radar, which is quite odd. Didn't see any type of signs of a storm approaching until now. You guys better hurry back. Boom. A nice sized wave hit the blind side of the boat, sending me flying off into the water and pushing the boat into the others. Me flying off into the water. I hurried and put on my mask as the power of the wave forced me down under. I watched Mike and Jackson get pushed back further and eventually dragged down by the follow-up of more waves. I grabbed Liz's arm before she could get pulled away any further, and we both swam up. <laughs> Jesus, Captain, are you... Oh my god, what is it? I followed Liz's eyes up and saw a giant, monstrous wave approaching us, ready to crash down right on the boat. Captain! The sound of water crashing and flowing in all sorts of directions snapped me back. I tried to keep calm, but in all my years, I've never been in this type of situation before. Liz! Where's Liz? I looked around, giving myself a headache due to how fast I was turning my head. Crackling. Evan! I'm right! Right here! The radio sounded distorted, and Liz was almost unrecognizable. Liz? Liz, can you hear me? Ugh. What the hell just happened? Questioned Jackson over the staticky radio. We got hit. I'm too far under to see the boat. Okay, okay, uh, l let, me, let me just try contacting him. Jackson? Are you there? Jesus. Jesus, Evan? Please tell me you're seeing what I'm seeing, said Liz, her voice sounding shaky. Confused, I looked around, and to my horror, I saw it. It looked like the edge of the world. Just how deep were we? The ground ended off in a completely straight line, and beyond that was nothing. Nothing but pitch black darkness. What the hell is a cliff doing here? Mike? Oh my god, I thought I lost you, said Liz and Wary. <laughs> nah. Still here. Jackson? Evan? I'm here. We lost comms with Jackson. Wait. I think I see him. Look down to the edge. 
Me and Liz both looked down and saw Jackson. Slowly moving off of the edge. Jackson! What the hell are you doing? Get back up here now! I tried to stop him. We all did. But he wouldn't listen. I, I don't know what happened to him, but I... Still hear the words in my head, the final words. As Jackson slowly came off the edge, he said something that threw all three of us. Do you see it? It's down there, waiting. Waiting for the right moment. What are you talking about, Jackson? What's waiting? Just come on back. Let's get out of here, please. Jackson let out a small gasp. He says, thank you. Thank you for awakening me. You set me free. Then from a calming voice to the sound of fear, he said, Oh my God. Guys, we shouldn't have come down here. We aren't alone. Jackson started violently thrashing his arms, trying to swim up and away from the dark abyss. It's coming! Oh God, it's coming! It's gonna kill us all! We're all gonna die! And that's when we saw it. A long, dark, greenish, sort of scaly, long body quickly rushed up. In size, it was massive. About the size of four great-sized mansions, but even then... I don't think even that was enough to explain just how huge this thing was. I watched Jackson get swallowed by it whole. The mouth area was so damn large, it took up most of the abyss. The teeth were the size of giant, icy glaciers, and they were very, very sharp. However, that wasn't the scariest part about its mouth. What frightened me the most was the rows of teeth the thing had. In a circular look... I saw five rows of teeth sticking out. Holy shit, said Mike. The creature then took off further away. We watched what felt like ten minutes of its body swimming away. Then from the darkness, I saw two giant white lights. Though they weren't lights at all, they were the creature's pupils as its face slowly approached us. And it spoke to us. Its voice deep and stern you do not belong. You have been abandoned, and soon you will be forgotten as well. I saw its body make all kinds of curves and rotations in the distance. There seemed to be no end to it. Mike, Mike, what are you doing? Liz questioned in fear. I looked down to see Mike moving towards the creature. I do not belong. I've been abandoned. I will soon be forgotten. I am nothing. Those were Mike's last words as I saw him move ever so slightly towards the creature, almost as if he was being pulled into it. I looked at the creature and I saw its mouth. Its mouth was open. It stretched so far out that it could fit multiple of our boats into it. And as I stared, I thought myself muttering something. I, I do. I do not belong. The same words said by Mike. I quickly forced myself to turn away. Liz, turn away now! She was nowhere to be found. I looked down once more and saw her, repeating the same words as Mike and slowly moving towards the creature's mouth. No. I wanted to say something. Believe me, I, I did, but I just couldn't. I knew I wouldn't be able to get through to her, and I knew what was going to happen if I stayed any longer. I quickly began to swim up as my heart pounded inside my chest. Please, please let me make it. In the distance, I saw the boat slowly sinking down to the ground. Oh God, no. The surface slowly began to appear. Just a bit more. Then, after what felt like forever, I finally broke the surface of the water and began to swim faster. Faster than I've ever swam in my life. I don't know what direction I was heading in, but I didn't care. Just as long as I wasn't in the same direction as that thing, I didn't even think to call it a creature anymore. I think I swam for about 15 minutes before my arms got tired and my legs began to give out on me. There was nothing in sight, and I soon gave up hope. I laid myself back, and I floated. As I did, I began to have flashbacks. 
Flashbacks that went back to when I first discovered the ocean, to when my parents first took me swimming at the beach. It all appeared to me as a blur, but it slowly faded into darkness. I awoke inside of a hospital, doctors surrounding me as I tried to keep my eyes open. Stay still. Don't move. Jackson. Mike. The search teams weren't able to find your friends, nor the boat. It's lucky they found you. It was then that I had one last flashback, one last image in my brain. It was a vision of the thing that... the thing that killed my friends. Jackson, Mike, Liz, all long gone. Doctors say I ended up fainting shortly after waking up and became unresponsive. I then went into a short-term coma, one only lasting a few weeks to a month. When I woke up, the hospital room was empty, but the space around me was filled with get-well cards and colorful balloons by my bedside. I was later checked out of the hospital and got to return to my home. Now that I return back to work, of course not. I mean, I'll never go back. Not after what happened. After a while, I began experiencing night terrors, hallucinations every once in a while. And hell, I even developed thalassophobia, the fear of deep bodies of water. Just like the ocean. I soon started to feel like I was losing my mind. I started hearing voices in my head. Visions of watching my friends be swallowed by that monstrous thing. My entire life felt like it was falling apart, which... Which is why I eventually ended up going to a therapist. But not even he could help. Now I find myself writing this, not knowing when to end it. What I do know is that we're not alone. This world does not belong to us. I don't belong. I've been abandoned. And I'll soon be forgotten. I am nothing. We are not alone. When I first saw it, I thought I simply needed a cup of coffee. I'd been to a wedding the night before. My old school friend Angie was getting hitched, to be honest. I hit the open bar a little too hard, especially when I had plans to finish a story earlier the next day. Though they're rarely read, the Habitsville Gazette articles don't write themselves, and my boss would have my neck if he gets another sorry I'm late email from his least punctual small town reporter, Sam Singer. That's me. So I went to the Sage Diner. I like the Sage because it's a hidden gem, tucked between a laundromat and tattoo parlor. The coffee machine in my apartment had been broken for a while now, and though I had ordered a new one, it had yet to be delivered. So getting my caffeine fix required an outside excursion. I opened the door with a quaint little jingle and took my usual spot in the back corner, away from the scattered elderly couples having brunch, past the yawning truckers having lunch, and across from the television so I could watch the local news. I hate the local news in Habitsville. Not just because they don't ever report on the strangeness of our little small town, or because digital news is putting print media out of business, but because they're so... good. They got this new field reporter, Meg Carlisle, and she puts my work to shame. So quick-witted, well-spoken, all real professional. Nothing like me. Still buzzed on a Sunday morning, trying to wave over a waitress for some coffee before I write my next piece. Meg was on that day, reporting from Western Habitsville. Apparently a huge sinkhole had opened up by the post office, and she was standing on the sidewalk, her forehead creased as she motioned to the disaster. The sinkhole has overtaken the eastern corner of the Habitsville Post Office parking lot now. Citizens are advised to stay clear of the area until government resources can be dispatched and damages can be assessed. Their voice came through, tinny and faint over the clinking of dishes and chatter of the diner. My eyes were glued on the image on the screen. The sinkhole was enormous and quite unusual. In fact, it might have been the first sinkhole we had in Habitsville in decades. I wonder what caused it, whether it was truly a natural disaster or something more up my alley. But amongst all of this thinking, 
There was a distraction. Past Meg Carlyle and her gesturing hands, behind the gaping sinkhole full of debris, there was a man on the front sidewalk of the Habitsville post office. It was hard to see his face, but he clearly wasn't part of the police nor cleanup crew. I could just make out his shape. Medium size and build, standing perfectly still, looking in the direction of the news crew. Cup of joe for you today, Sam. I jumped slightly as Pam, my favorite waitress at the Sage Diner, spoke behind me. <laughs> you know me too well, Pam, I answered, laughing nervously. She smiled and nodded, then looked at the TV. Can you believe it? She said. Her grin fell and she shook her head. Thank goodness no one was hurt. Yeah, I agreed, looking back to the screen. I could still see him, the shape of the man in the background. They say nobody's allowed on the premises. Think anybody noticed that guy? I asked, motioning towards the man. What guy? Pam asked, leaning forward and squinting. The, the man, I answered, pointing this time. Right over Meg's left shoulder, right in front of the post office, on the, on the other side of the hole. He's even inside the caution tape. Pam furrowed her brow and peered into the screen for a few more seconds, then laughed. <laughs> You're a strange one, singer. Too early in the morning to be playing jokes on me. I opened my mouth to say that that, that wasn't the case, but... Pam walked away to take the next table's order. I turned my attention back to the screen, but Meg Carlyle, the sinkhole, and the strange man within the caution tape were gone. Instead, there was a commercial for laundry detergent. Eventually, Pam brought me my coffee, and as the first few sips warmed me, I took out my little red notebook to start piecing together my next story for the paper. Though the caffeine made my head a little less foggy, I had to admit, I was fresh out of ideas. Habitsville had been quiet for about a month. There wasn't much material to work with. I could write about the sinkhole, but with the news covering it 24-7, I doubted my boss would want me to put in my two cents. He tended not to trust me with the big stories. I let my eyes drift away from the empty note page in front of me and back to the television. Meg Carlyle had come back on and repeated much of the same facts about the sinkhole that she had shared before. And then it was a commercial from a blood pressure medication. Some picturesque, perfectly gray old man playing with his grandkids at the park, successfully staying alive to do so with the help of this little white pill. I had my coffee cup halfway to my mouth when I saw it. I blinked once, twice, three times, but the image wouldn't go away. There on the park bench, behind the old guy and his grandkids, frolicking in the grass, was the man. It seemed impossible. It, it was impossible, and yet, and yet, there he was. The man on the bench, the man in the sinkhole. He was middle-aged, in a beige windbreaker and navy pants. He had close-cropped hair, sensible shoes, and an ordinary face. He had those big square glasses, you know, the ones from the 80s that reflect so much light you can't see the wearer's eyes. This much I had already been able to gather from seeing him within the caution tape on the live news feeds. But what I hadn't been able to see before was what he was saying. By the position of his head, I could tell that his gaze didn't linger on the children, nor the old man on the blood pressure medication. Instead, he stared directly into the camera. As the voiceover droned on about side effects and asking your doctor is blah 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 right for you, I could see the man's mouth moving, though I couldn't hear his words. His lips twisted silently. I could have sworn the man was saying, You. My spine prickled once I recognized the word, and a deep sense of dread crept its way into the very marrow of my bones. I should have felt silly. You know, like I said, the man was average looking. It was entirely likely that he was merely sharing a passing resemblance to the man in the sinkhole footage. And, and perhaps my eyes were playing tricks on me. Maybe maybe what I thought was you was actually an attempt by a commercial extra to suppress a sneeze. Realizing I'd been holding my cup halfway to my open mouth for about 45 seconds, I placed the ceramic back onto the saucer and tried to shake myself out of whatever had taken hold of me. Perhaps I was still drunk from the night before. Eventually, Pam came back and refilled my cup. I thanked her, 
then asked as politely and as normally as I could, Hey, could we possibly uh, change the channel on the TV? She raised her eyebrows and rested the coffee pot on her hip. Sure, hon, if you want. Then she fished into her apron and pulled out an ancient remote, stained with coffee and sticky with decades of maple syrup. I was embarrassed when the hand that accepted the remote shook, but Pam didn't seem to notice that. Just she hadn't noticed the odd specter inside the caution tape. I switched the channels quickly. The TV was one of those old, chunky ones with the antenna protruding from the top, so it didn't pick up much. Eventually, I settled on a sitcom for the early 90s, with some mundane but harmless plot. A teenage girl doesn't like her new stepmom. Perfect. You're not my real mom, the girl was saying, crossing her arms. I turned back to the page in front of me, the one that hadn't yet been kissed by my pen. There was nothing, absolutely nothing to write about. Whether my head was clear or not, I could try to put together something about the sinkhole. Or maybe my boss wouldn't turn it down if I had it ready Monday morning. Fresh article about fresh news. Played off on his desk first thing. You're not my real mom! Something... Like, something wasn't right. That line, I mean, the, the girl had already said it. You're not my real... You're not real... You're not... You... 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 I looked up. There was the teenager, arms still crossed. And the stepmom, Botoxed forehead, just barely creased, standing in the middle of the living room. The girl was saying her line over and over as the TV skipped, and between the glitches of static, as the tape rewound, I could see him. There, sitting on the couch, in a late 90s living room, was the man. My mind told me I was being ridiculous, but the surge of fear that instinctually raced through me told me otherwise. It was the same man. He, he wasn't partaking in the argument, nor milling about like an extra as the footage continued to skip and the girl's mouth opened and closed. The man stared ahead, directly into the camera, directly at me, sitting in the diner. As the girl's voice repeated itself, so too did the movement of the man's lips. You, he was mouthing, as the actress's voice echoed the same statement. You, you, you. He continued like this. And I continued to watch. The remote felt cold and heavy in my sweating hands. Trembling, I tried to hit the power button and shut the machine off entirely, but, but it wouldn't work. I pressed it again and again and again, but whether it was stuck due to a lifetime of hash brown grease or something far more sinister, the television would not turn off. I changed the channel, and for a blissful moment, the torturous repetition of that terrible word ceased. I could breathe. It was a game show. One of those trivia ones. A math teacher from Ohio was trying to name a hit song from 2010. But he wasn't coming up with anything. You can do it, the host said with a plastic grin. The camera cut to the audience, a crowd of smiling, cheering people. I felt my shoulders relax. The pain in my chest lessened. You can do... The air stopped dead in my throat. You can... You... 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 I lifted my gaze. Third row, sixth seat, between a Midwestern family of four and an old woman doing a crossword was the man. His mouth was moving, gray, grainy lips fixating on the same word as the same few frames replayed over and over again. Finally, with a deep pit of dread in my stomach, still hot from my coffee, I did something incredibly odd and... Immensely disturbing, I raised my shaking hand and slowly pointed a finger towards my chest. Me? I asked out loud. At first, nothing happened. Then the man raised his own hand and pointed at the camera. You. He mouthed again. Then the television changed its own channel. We were back to the local news with Meg Carlyle talking about the sinkhole. The huge, cavernous thing was still in the background, framed by bright yellow tape. And there in the very back was the man, just as I had seen him before. Waiting. It's hard to explain why I went to the sinkhole. I mean, perhaps 
Perhaps it was a compulsory need to satiate my own curiosity, or maybe it was just plain masochism. Truthfully, I was a little afraid of what would happen if I didn't show up to that very spot just outside of the Habitsville post office, where I knew he would be. It was easy to get past the police, since they were used to me creeping around news spots with my little red notebook, and I could see Meg Carlyle holding her microphone, speaking to the camera. I ducked around the side of the post office and approached the sectioned off area. Up close, the sinkhole was terrifying. It had that great, ancient feeling that humans often live their entire lives without experiencing. The same sensation of staring into the inky abyss of an underwater trench or the center of a black hole sucking up asteroids, stars, entire worlds. But the sight of the sinkhole was nothing compared to seeing the man from the television in the flesh. But disturbingly enough, he wasn't flesh. The man looked exactly the same as he had on the screen, not just in terms of his beige windbreaker and ambiguous expression, but in the physiological makeup of his body. He was grainy. The edges of him were unclear, constantly moving as, as I stared, I could see one of the frames of his glasses glitch in and out of existence. I would have said that he was some sort of hologram, but there were no projectors, no hidden devices, and the wood underneath him creaked as he shifted his weight on the bench. We stared at each other for a moment. The TV man and I could feel each of the pretenses that of the great sinkhole just in the corner of my eye and of the man. Though he was much smaller than the gaping hole in the earth, they had similar sensations. Powerful gravitational pulls as though coaxing the minds of mortals to wander a bit closer to the edges. And then the man spoke. Or rather, he mouthed the words. But after hearing him borrow voices to say it so many times, I knew what it was. You, he said silently, pointing a hand towards me. I, I didn't know what else to do but nod. Then he did something that he had never done before. He pointed away from himself, the tip of his grainy finger directing my eyes towards the very center of the sinkhole. A surge of fear ripped through my body. You, you want me to... The what? To look at the sinkhole? The man kept pointing, his expression difficult to read, his face flat and expressionless. The more I looked, the more I could see there were no signs of maliciousness on his face, no threats. He just simply watched me, pointing. I took a few more steps towards the sinkhole to appease him. Like this? I breathed in sharply as the man stood up. He took a few steps towards me and pointed again, as though trying to make his point clear. I, I, don't, I don't want to, I started to say, my feet shuffling only inches closer to the crevasse's edge. I didn't know what he wanted, or whether he wished me harm. I, I turned my head over to the news crew, to the shape of Meg Carlyle in the distance, but no one seemed to notice me, with a creature of static commanding me. I looked back at the man, his face flat with sparks of white glitching through his cheeks. A gust of wind came, seemingly up from the center of the sinkhole, and it brushed against my skin, warm and earthy like animal's breath. The air tussled the man's hair, even blew open his windbreaker a bit. And then I saw what the, what the TV man was wearing. Underneath the beige windbreaker was a pale blue shirt, carefully pressed and buttoned to the chin, it was tucked into his navy pants, cinched with a belt. It all looked very neat, very official. And there, right there, on the left side pocket was a logo. A blue eagle framed by gold stars and words between thick red and blue lines. U.S. Mail. It wasn't a TV man at all. He was, he was a mailman. I tore my eyes away from him and peered over the edge of the sinkhole towards where, where he was pointing. My heart was beating fast and hard in my chest, and my head swam with the sheer height of it, but 
Even despite my anxiety, I could see it. There was something white and square down in the pit of the sinkhole. It was smudged with dark, wet dirt, but even so, I could deduce what it was. A, a package. I looked from the mailman to the package, and then back. Are, 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 you, are you serious? I asked, not bothering to hide the disbelief in my voice. The entity said nothing, only continued his steadfast gesture. I thought about leaving, and in fact, I even took a step back away from the sinkhole, but when I did, a new feeling of dread surged through me. The waviness around the man's edges quickened as though he, he was vibrating. It seemed as though his image stretched outwards, expanding, and though his face didn't change, nor could I see the expression behind his glasses... I could guess what that meant. If I tried to leave, he was going to get angry. Okay, 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 I said, putting my hands up in defeat. Okay, I'm going. The descent into the sinkhole was treacherous and frightening. Gusts of humid wind kept coming up from the dark pit below. My knuckles were white and aching from hanging on to any handholds that I could find as I stumbled farther and farther down. Eventually, I made it down to the white box. I looked up to see the mailman now pointing down at me, still vibrating slightly at the edges, as though he was growing impatient. I picked up the box quickly and half tucked it under my shirt in order to free up my hands for the climb back to the surface. I reached the top, huffing and puffing, dirt caked under my fingernails. I blinked the sweat from my eyes, and I could see the image of the mailman in front of me, his arms finally down, no longer pointing. I retrieved the package from the inside of my shirt and cautiously held it out to him. Here, I said. He didn't say anything, but I saw his lips move. One last, you. And then with a flash like a television turning off, the mailman collapsed in on himself and blinked out of existence. I sat down on the ground. I could still hear the voice of Meg Carlyle somewhere over my shoulder describing, for at least the fifteenth time, about how the sinkhole came to be, where it was, what was being done about it. I used my dirt-stained shirt to brush the soil away from the label, to read the name and address that was printed there. Though the street was smudged, I could read the name. Samuel Singer. I opened the box, right there outside the post office. New coffee maker. That wasn't all. Inside, in a brightly colored piece of paper, was a coupon. Five dollars off my next purchase for late delivery. The traffic was heavy in downtown Toronto during rush hour. Driving slowly, we made our way along roads crammed with other cars, bike messengers, street cars, and jaywalking pedestrians. Tall buildings towered over us all around. Glass-walled skyscrapers and concrete behemoths. Stopped at a red light adjacent to an alley, the stench of a dumpster overfilled with weak old seafood waste, and used diapers wafted over, making me gag. We were on our way to a baseball game, and my brother had found a cheap parking lot online. The only catch was that it was a bit of a hike to the Rogers Center, where the Blue Jays played their games. It was taking forever to get to the discount parking place, immersed in the heavy traffic. At one point, it took us 15 minutes just to make a right turn due to the constant crush of pedestrians and car traffic. It was a hot day. I was getting sick of driving, sick of other people flaunting their utter content for every single traffic law, not to mention basic human decency. The idea of 30 more minutes fighting through the city streets was too much to bear, and I pulled into the next underground parking garage I saw, telling my brother Noel that I would pay whatever the cost was myself. He looked shocked. Now, this place would be likely triple the cost. But he shrugged it off and said, I'd do what I liked. The steel sliding door rolled up on its tracks to let us in. They closed down, shut behind us, drenching the tunnel in near total darkness. I had to stop the car, turning on my headlights to see as we wound our way downward into the parking structure. There were very few signs in the dimly lit garage. Only one-way street signs pointing to the left, then to the right, and telling us where to go. All the parking spots were filled near the top, so we continued going down the ramps, deeper and deeper into the parking structure. Cars were parked in every single spot. 
There was not one to be had as we went down through levels. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L. Wow, this is starting to get ridiculous, I said, as we entered section T. I've never seen a parking garage that goes down this far, Noel marveled, as we turned another corner and descended even deeper. I started feeling dizzy from the constant turning in circles going down the ramps of the parking structure. Slowing down, I felt woozy for a moment. Then I started driving again, slowly at first. It felt like it was hard to breathe so far down beneath the earth. The air thick and suffocating. This place is huge, Noel said, as we got down to level X. It was starting to get more and more unsettling, driving downward in the darkness. It's just a never-ending sea of black cars. Every single one looked identical after a while, like they were mirror images of each other. They had dark-tinted windows, no logo to distinguish the brand, and the make or the model. This place is starting to creep me out. Can we go back? Like, just reverse out of here, man? There's nobody behind you. I tried to go backwards, but found there was a sliding steel door blocking the path going back up. Seeing they were automated to let us go through, but then came back down once we were past. All of them functioned seamlessly on sensors so that we hadn't even noticed them. But I imagined dozens of them leading all the way back up, blocking our path. Something occurred to me, suddenly. Have you seen any doors other than those? I mean, any stairs leading up out of here? He shook his head. Lines of apprehension furrowed into his face. No, I, um, I haven't seen any people down here other than us, either. We got out of the car together and tried to lift up the steel door. Straining with all of my strength, I tried to pull it up out of the ground. It wouldn't budge. There was no help intercom or any other way of getting a hold of someone running this place. Frustrated, I pulled out the tire iron from the trunk. It drove it between the pavement and the door, trying to pry it open. Yeah, it wouldn't budge. Even with all of my body weight trying to force it upwards, my hands were getting cold and going numb, and I realized it was chilly down here on the lower levels. Much colder than the balmy summer night up on the street. This was the first moment we began to suspect something was really wrong. I mean, still, we had no choice but to keep going downwards, it seemed. And there was nowhere else to go. After waiting for what seemed like hours for someone else to come through the door, we decided to try going forward a little ways more. I just hoped at some point the ramps would lead us out and would bring us back to the surface. Since that had been my experience with parking garages in the past, I mean, why, why would anyone build an underground parking facility with no exit at all? I started driving again, my hands gripping the steering wheel with white knuckles. My breaths were coming far too quickly and my heart was beating fast. I told myself to try to stay calm, try to convince myself that this was okay, this, this was normal. Suddenly the letters on the wall indicating which level we were on began to change. After the Z, they stopped being recognizable from our alphabet, or, or from any other that I had seen on Earth. They appeared ancient, druidic carved into the stone with precision. Other than that, the place was the same, dim, flickering fluorescence glowing overhead, black cars going on forever as you went down each row, only the light seemed to be getting dimmer with each level we went down, and it was getting colder too. I turned on the heater, trying to warm up the car, and that was when I noticed my breath was pluming frostily into the air with each breath, as was my brother's. What is this place? Noel asked. I didn't have any answer. The structure made no sense. It wasn't really a parking garage, though. That was becoming abundantly clear. We kept going down, deeper and deeper, feeling like Indiana Jones and his companions exploring a never-ending underground cavern. There was nothing to see, other than rows of black cars, one after another, each level the same until they weren't. At a certain point, the architecture started to look wonky. Now, I don't know how to describe it other than that. It was like like a kid had drawn up the plans for it instead of professional engineers or architects. The cars were crammed closer together in places, almost touching each other at strange angles. In other sections, things were spaced far apart. We almost could have squeezed our car in between two others, almost, but like, not quite. 
And even if we could, there was nowhere to go. We had already established that there was no doors leading to stairs anywhere, no elevators or other points of egress either. We went down to the next level. Simoleon. The car's roof almost scraped against the ceiling. The wheels nearly lifted off the ground as we rounded the bend in an uneven ramp. Okay, this place is seriously freaking me out, my brother said, gripping the oh shit handle on his side of the car. Me too, man. Me too. Clearly going down further was not working. We were just going deeper and deeper into the dark abyss of madness that this place held within it. But getting out of the car was no longer viable either. We were dressed in t-shirts and shorts since it was a hot summer day. But I can only guess how cold the temperature in the parking garage was at this point. Yeah, the heat cranked up to the maximum. And we were both still shivering. The gaslight began to flash yellow, catching my eye. I didn't mention this fact to Noel. Not yet. I didn't want to scare him any more than he already was. We continued going downward. The light now sparse and separated by huge gaps of distance. Sometimes only one defective light was flickering for an entire level, then absent entirely in others. Our surroundings were continuing to get stranger and stranger, no longer resembling a parking garage anymore, but... Cavernous hellscape. The darkness and the feeling of suffocating beneath the ground was becoming impossible to ignore. I began to hyperventilate with claustrophobia, feeling that we were on our way downwards towards our inevitable deaths, trapped far beneath the earth, or... Or perhaps something much worse than death. Perhaps we would simply continue driving downward forever into blackness, round and round in spiraling circles. Finally, the car began to sputter and die as it ran out of gas. I wished more than anything at that moment I had driven around with more than just a quarter of a tank. We would have had more time to think of a plan if I had just sprung for a fill-up the last time I had visited the gas station. No, all didn't seem surprised. He'd probably noticed the gaslight, too, and just decided not to say anything about it. As the car coasted to a stop in the pitch blackness, I looked around. It was pure darkness in all directions. We couldn't even see a few feet in front of the car, despite the headlights still running off the battery. The darkness was getting thicker, more tenacious, and suffocating all around us. I imagined it wouldn't be long before it finished us, you know, invading our lungs and our bloodstreams like a noxious gas, paralyzing us with dread before painfully poisoning us to death with our own terror. The car battery died abruptly, much faster than it should have, and we were plunged into complete darkness. I turned the key back and forth to no avail. The battery was done for. And so were we. The sounds could be heard outside the car, sounds of movement, scurrying noises, scratching claws, raking against the steel doors of various nearby automobiles, long ear-splitting screeches getting closer. Something began to bump against the right side of the car, jostling it to the other side as we, as we shivered from the cold and grabbed hold of whatever we could to brace ourselves from what might come next. It felt like something huge was brushing up against the car like a like a huge worm beneath the surface of the earth, using these tunnels as passage. For a while, it felt like the car would tip over. As the sound of the thing moved past outside, dragged on and on forever, but eventually it ceased, and the car settled back on its axles. It was silent again in the darkness. Freezing cold, lonely, despite the presence of my brother, mere inches away, I, I felt as if I would die down here. My life began to flash before my eyes as I waited for death to come in, in whatever form it would take. I remembered my phone suddenly in my pocket. The screen would give off a little bit of light, and that was a relief. It was still a signal somehow, even all the way down here, and just enough battery to type this up and send it out to you all as a warning. If you happen upon the parking garage, the one with too many levels, don't go down any further. Stay near the surface. Get out while you still can. And if you see a parking attendant, please... Tell them we're stuck down here. Help us. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to let you know about the Chilling app. I've talked about the Chilling app before, but I want to let you guys know about it again because I'm on it. And also because there's a whole bunch of new stories that I've just done for them that came out this month. 
including a series that I've been really into. I don't get to choose the stories that go on there. I'm going to say that right out. I don't get to choose the stories that go on there. They pick out the stories, which they have picked out some really, really good ones, including a series called The Space In Between that I have been riveted to my seat to know how it ended. And now I know how it ended, but you won't know how it ends unless you go check out The Chilling App. The Chilling App links are in the description down below. And if you go quick, and by quick, I mean like, I think it's just like a few more days. So really quick, you can enter to be able to win an Oculus Quest 2 bundle, which includes the Oculus Quest 2, Resident Evil 4, Blair Witch, Oculus Quest Edition, The Exorcist, VR, and a $250 Amazon gift card. So, I mean, hey, there's, there's, really, there's really no part that's bad about starting your free trial now. And now, on to tonight's story. As I pulled up in front of the shop, I had to recheck my directions. It was a dingy little hole in the wall stuffed between a Dollar General and a computer repair shop. It looked like it had just existed here since the creation of the first VHS tape. The windows were covered in a thick yellow paper, and the outside was caked in a film of old dirt. The sign on the door said open, but it was barely visible through the dirty window. There was no way this place was what I wanted. When I was a kid, I remembered watching a show on cable called Children of Man. As a kid... The premise of the show appealed to me. The show was about kids living in an island out in the Pacific trying to survive day-to-day -day trials. The producers had gotten 40 kids from all over America, ages 10 to 12, and dropped them off with supplies and instructions on how to survive. The host, Chris Mansworth, was a survival expert, and he would create challenges every day for the kids to complete. There were four teams of 10 kids, and the winner of each challenge got something cool for their area of the village. I watched the show religiously as a kid. Every Saturday night, right after The Simpsons, the show would come on and I would be enthralled. I always imagined that I was on the island with them, surviving day to day. The challenges were always neat, too. They, they had the kids gut and clean their own meat, dig wells by hand, build rafts for the raft race, and make aqueducts so their village could have running water. It was a, a neat idea. But the show just stopped after eight episodes. I watched the show religiously as a kid, every Saturday night right after The Simpsons. No new episodes came out, and the station never gave a reason. This was before the internet, and there was no way to check for online updates. So the show slipped off into obscurity, and my ten-year-old self just... forgot about it. I remember the show again a few years ago when Mom sent me a box of my stuff from the attic. There was a couple of old VHS tapes in there, and between... Batman the Animated Series and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were eight tapes with handwritten labels that read Children of Man. We had a VHS recorder when I was a kid, and I can remember recording my favorite shows to watch later. I was excited to get to see the old show again, and the memories flooding back, and I started looking for a VHS player amongst the tapes in the box. Well, there wasn't one, but a quick trip to the Goodwill and $15, and I had a gently used VCR hooked up to my TV, and I watched all eight episodes back to back and fell in love with the show all over again. I remember the kids I liked, Robert and Catherine, were my favorites, but many of the kids had also been given a lot of screen time, and it was hard not to like them too. As I watched, I found myself wanting to see how the show ended all over again. As I watched the show again, I began to notice, well, something a little darker under the surface, something I hadn't noticed as a kid. The village was divided into four teams, green snakes, bluebirds, red foxes, and brown mice. The teams had mostly been divided up by background, which seemed very divisive to me as an adult. The green snakes did most of the hunting for the village. A lot of their kids had a rural background, while the brown mice did most of the farming and the gathering, because, well, they had come from a farm background. The red foxes were in charge of construction and upkeep. They were the smarter kids, and they worked with the bluebirds, who were in charge of food management and cooking the meals. Every team had a representative who sat on a council. Robert sat for the green snakes, Catherine sat for the bluebirds, Marco for the red foxes, and Charin for the brown mice. As the show went on, it became apparent that Robert didn't trust Marco, and with good reason. Marco and Charin had formed a kind of alliance of their own, though most of it was because Marco bullied her into doing what he wanted. Robert and Catherine had set up their own alliance, and Robert started holding out food to sway Catherine's decisions. The village needed food, 
and Robert pointed out that he and Catherine were the only ones providing it. Robert and Catherine wanted a fair split for everyone, but Marco tried to split them into a class system that would put his foxes in the higher tier. Robert didn't like that, and it became clear that if Chris hadn't been there, we would have seen a lot more fights. Robert was a big 12-year-old, a stocky bruiser who won battles with his fists most of the time, and Chris had separated him and Marco more than once. Marco was smaller, but definitely had charisma. He had most of the mice and all of the foxes on his side, and I wasn't sure how I missed all this tension as a kid. It all came to a head in episode 6. Marco was caught hoarding food in the Red Fox Village, and it wasn't just food that the other teams had been bringing in either. He had been taking the comfort foods from the canteen the brown mice ran for the village and storing them in his hut. Robert discovered this and took Marco prisoner, demanding that he be placed on trial. The whole village was in an uproar, but Marco agreed to be confined to a central cabin until the council could rule on his trial. Chris was setting the whole trial up as an episode 8 draw for viewers. At the end of episode 8, the council found Marco guilty, and the episode had ended with a lot of shaky camera work and the red foxes storming the podium where Marco was seated. And that was how the show ended. The little bell chimed overhead as I stepped into the tiny place. The store looked like a throwback, sharp-looking rickety shelves that were covered in plastic VHS boxes and thick dust. The shelves held VHS tapes, Betamax, and DVD cases that were arranged neatly amongst the filth and dust. A quick look showed that they were all in alphabetical order, like some ancient library. The shelves fronted onto a glass display case that held murky wonders within. On the counter was a television, an ashtray stacked with old butts, and the greasy store clerk who smiled at me as I approached. You the one who called about the tape? He asked, showing a mouth of stained teeth. I searched for months on my own. I had taken to the internet in an attempt to find something, anything, that would give me some closure. Wikipedia told me that only eight episodes were aired, but twelve had been intended. As I dug deeper, I began to see that the show was a mystery all on its own. The list of children that had been in the show were woefully incomplete. Marco and Robert were there, so were Catherine and Charreen, and Chris is the host, but none of the other children were even named. No one except Chris Mansworth had gone on to do anything after the show, and his only contribution was his death a few months later. His wiki said that he had committed suicide in his hotel room, and foul play was not suspected. As for the last four episodes of Children of Man, there was no mention. So I took to the usual online sleuths, Reddit, 4chan, TV message boards. No one seemed to have the answer. Most people had never even heard of Children of Man, and the ones who had were more interested in my copies than the last four episodes. Apparently the episodes were never compiled or released for purchase, and the only means by which the show still existed was on VHS tapes like mine. I had several offers for them. One guy, one guy wanted to give me $500 per tape, but, you know, I declined. I told them I'd post copies of the tapes here for free if they wanted. And that's how I met Charleston Hammer 462. He was a user on the hometown board of Reddit. He saw my post and posted videos and got in contact with me about the place I was currently in. Heard you were looking for a certain tape? In my line of work, when you're looking for something, you go talk to Reggie. He owns a shop in Burlington, South Carolina called Video Time Capsule. If you need a banned episode of a 70s drama or a never aired documentary from the 60s, you talk to Reggie. I read the messages a few times before responding. Thanks, Charleston. But these episodes aren't just unaired, they're unknown. No one has ever seen them. I don't even know if they exist. And the store you're talking about is over 400 miles away. I figured I'd never hear from him again when I hit send on the message. It took him an hour to respond. What you're after is very rare. I used to watch Children of Men myself when I was younger. It ended so abruptly that it's been an internet mystery since the net was just wells and message boards. I didn't learn about the last four episodes, though, until I met Reggie at TVCon. We got to talking about old TV shows, and after a few drinks, 
He told me that he had the last four episodes of Children of Men. Now that perked my interest. Have you seen them? The response took a little longer. I have. It's some pretty different shit. I won't ruin it for you, but if you value the way you remember Children of Men, then don't watch it. There's a reason these episodes never made it to the air. Here's the number to the store. If it's late, call him anyway. Reggie keeps weird hours, and sometimes that store is open 24 hours. He's an eccentric dude. Don't doubt. He has what you're looking for. The number was at the bottom of the message. Yeah, I said, no longer sure about what I was doing. Uh, yeah, I, I called you about the complete series of children and man. He nodded, reaching under the counter and slapping a plain white case on the counter. All eight episodes recorded at airing, he said, his eyes studying me. I frowned. Um, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm after the last four episodes. His piggy eyes glinted behind the grease-smeared glasses. There were only eight episodes that aired. And you told me that you had the other four episodes that never aired. He smiled, and it did ghastly things to his porcelain face. Had to be sure. Come to the back. And with that... He disappeared behind a curtain into the back of the store. I walked around, hesitating for a moment as I touched the curtain and followed him. I'd come 400 miles. Might as well go another five feet into hell. The phone rang six times. I was just about to hang up when someone answered and spoke through a mouthful of food. I didn't understand him, but once he had swallowed whatever he had in his mouth, he tried again. Real time capsule, uh, where your memories are always on sale. What a tagline. Yeah, I was looking for something specific. The sound of something being stuffed into the speaker's mouth and loud chewing assaulted my ears before he continued. Aren't they all? What you looking for? Clearly, customer service was not their strong suit. Um, ep episodes 9 through 12 of Children of Men? I heard something hit the floor, and the speaker cursed loudly. Yeah, um, uh, you must be mistaken. There are only eight episodes of Children and Men. Okay, look, I said a little hotly. I was told that you would have things that no one else does. I, I want to see these episodes. I don't even want to buy them, and uh, I was told, I was told that you have them in your possession. Is there any way that I could just $500? The voice returned, and the tone was not one to be bargained with. In cash, before I'll even let you see him. I agreed. Despite the outrageous price, and now I was here in this grungy shop, prepared to go into the back. The back was worse than the front. DVDs and VHS tapes were stacked in teetering piles. The back room was lit by only a few dingy overheads, and I could see an old TV casting its glow from the back. The floor was riddled with trash, and I swear you could hear the mice scampering around to get out of my way. What sort of videos could I find here? Would this place give me anything but heartbreak? It seemed like the setup to a thousand scary stories, and I suddenly didn't want to see these mysterious artifacts. But like anyone else who comes this close to finding the thing they want, I needed to see them. Reggie was waiting for me by the TV. He had an ancient set that looked very similar to the one my parents owned. On top was a VHS-DVD combo player and a set of rabbit ears that stuck out like weather vanes. There was a wooden chair in front of it with a little blue pad in it. Reggie held his hand out. 500, he said. How do I know this is authentic? Look, okay, I could get in a lot of trouble for even owning this. You think guys who possess kid stuff go to prison for a long time? This would put me under the prison for life. If you want to see those episodes, then then I need the money. We're doing this business here or what? I handed him the money. And he popped the cassette tape in and he walked away. Not joining me? I asked. Not for another 500 bucks, kid. I heard the curtain rustle as the show began. Episode 9 gave us a recap of the trial and then the storming of the stage. When the show started, I noticed a distinct lapse in film quality. 
Whoever was operating the cameras was much shorter than their usual crew, and they seemed barely able to handle the heavy rig. Finally, the camera had Robert in the frame, and he began to fill us in on what had happened in the village. It's been about three days since Marco's trial and his escape. Since then, Fox Village has been separated from our village. They took most of the brown mice with them, and now they tried to raid us every night for food. Something's going on over there. We heard shouts this morning and... But at that point, the shouts got louder, and Robert ran off screen as the camera tried to follow him. We came to the edge of the Red Fox Village, many of the huts that were once on the verge having been burnt out, making a kind of barricade between them and the rest of the village. Many voices were cheering as something swung from the tree. At first, I thought it was an effigy, a dummy maybe, but... Then I realized it was Shireen. She swung like a grotesque wind chime in the space between the villages, and Robert shouted for Marco to stop being a coward and come out. Some of the kids were crying, but everyone on the other side cheered and shouted, traitor or faithless, at the swinging body of Shireen. I sat glued to the TV, unsure if any of this was even real. It was night when the next recording resumed. It seemed that whoever was running the camera wanted us to see a raid. The night vision on the camera showed kids with torches fighting other kids who were leaving their storehouse in a hurry. The kids with torches hacked at them with machetes, blood flying as they connected, and some of them dropped as they were stabbed or hacked to pieces by the blades of other children. The rest of the episodes were mostly uneventful. Lots of shaky cam, lots of crying, and at one point, someone dropped it and didn't pick it up for several minutes. As the episode ended, I was left looking at my own stark face, looking back at me. What did I just watch? I mean, there was no way that that could be the same show, right? Things, things had gone very Lord of the Flies in the village. And as the tenth episode started, I wasn't sure what to expect. Episode 10 started without preamble. There was no recap, there was no theme music, and the footage looked unedited. We see a much more professional camera crew and Chris Mansworth trying to bring some order back to the island. They're coming up to the shallows. Chris and about ten adults coming up in the dark towards the village. Chris was talking about how this had gotten out of hand and how they were going to try to rescue the children. As they came into the seemingly empty village, Chris cupped his hands and began to shout at the empty huts. He told them that the game was over and that it was time that they went home. He told them there was a boat that would take them home. Still no response. He moved deeper into the collection of straw huts and fires burning low around them. And that was when they struck. Kids with spears and machetes came screaming out of the darkness, and the cameramen backpedaled furiously as the adults were taken completely by surprise. Blood flew. Legs were sawed off as the pint-sized savages hacked and chopped. Chris Mansworth was buried under a pile of children as he screamed and flailed. As the cameraman tripped and went down, we saw the shadow of children standing over him as the spears came down. The episode ended abruptly. I was speechless. What the hell had happened to them? These were kids that had been doing challenges and making friends. The rivalry between Robert and Marco had always been the most serious part of the show, but now they they had, they had devolved into, into that. The 11th episode was about 10 minutes long. It opened on a stationary camera shot of the same space that they had held the trial. Marco was on his knees before the camera and he looked bad. His left eye was a puffy mess of bruised tissue. His, his left ear was a bleeding stump. His nose looked to be cut jaggedly. He was weeping silently and his tears were thick and bloody. Robert stood behind him. He had always worn a white football jersey in every episode I'd seen him in. But the garment was stained red and brown now. He bled from several places on his chest, and when he raised his machete, it was with obvious pain. This morning before the sun had risen, this dog attempted to attack our village. He violated the rules of war as agreed upon by he and I. He agreed to a battle between our two villages at dawn, and this snake tried to attack us in the night and lost. Thus his village is forfeit. It's the winner. I sentence him to death. Please, please, Robert. Chris Mansworth voice could be heard off screen. The show's over. You, you can all go home now. Back to your parents. It, 
It doesn't have to end like this. As Mako cried his terrible tears, Robert looked to Chris off screen and turned back to Marco. The show is over. This is our home now. He brought the machete down. Mako cried out and fell face first to the ground. Robert fell on him, hitting him with the machete again and again. Blood sprayed from the struggling child, and when Robert looked back to the camera, his face was spattered in gore. He reached out and the camera went off abruptly. The last episode was only a few minutes. It started with a shaky cam journey through the jungle. The runner was being pursued. I could hear the footsteps behind him. As the runner got to the shore, he jumped into something and pushed out into the water. The wooden deck of the boat came into view as he drifted out. I could hear oars working in the water. He sat the camera on the seat as he rowed. The face of children could be seen in the surrounding jungle. And then everything went dark. The tape clicked and the TV went back to static. I left it in the VCR and I stumbled out of the back room. Reggie was sitting behind the counter and looked up at me with something like sympathy. He held something back towards me and I saw it was my money. I shook my head and I stepped away from him. I had bought a ticket and I had paid the price. You gonna be okay? He asked. Yeah. So, what happened to the kids? They just... They, they just left them there? Reggie shrugged. Coast Guard picked up Chris Mansworth two days later. He was drifting in the ocean. He looked extremely rattled. Wouldn't tell him how he'd gotten out there or where he'd been. When he got back, he gave the tapes to the studio. Next time someone saw him, he was, he was dead. And the kids? Studio never pursued the show. Never sold the aired episodes. Never even tried to air what Chris brought back. They just made the whole thing disappear. I suppose there's an island out there full of kids who went on a TV show and never came back. Parents likely told them they'd been in an accident or something. The whole thing was hushed up and eventually people forgot. And you'll forget too one day, he added. Though it might help. As I lay in bed now, trying to forget the horrible things I saw, I hope that I do forget. But I doubt I ever will. So if you happen to find an island out in the Pacific, maybe one full of locals that just don't look right, turn your boat back out to sea. Because the people there, the people there are not friendly. Past the blaring light of the hallway, I could only see her silhouette. There's a monster in my closet, she said. My wife was more awake than me. She started to get out of bed. No, my daughter said. You don't go, Mommy. Daddy's braver. Peter, you hear that? Apparently you're braver, my wife mumbled as she slid back into the covers. I am, I said. The girl took after her mother with the overactive imagination. This wasn't the first time our daughter had woken us up in the middle of the night with abstract fears, and I, I feared that it wouldn't be the last. As I dug my slippers out from beneath the bed, I convinced myself that with a bit of rational thinking, I could put an end to these 2 a.m. wake-ups. It's the squiggle again, she whispered, dangling her legs from the bed. The squiggle was just another in a long list of creatures that would hide in my daughter's closet. There were goblins, there were bears, and, after a fumbled explanation of world politics, Osama bin Laden shared the closet space for about a month. That night, it was the squiggle. She kept on looking at the closet door, expecting me to open it like I always did, but I didn't. Instead, I sat down next to her on the bed. Can you describe the squiggle to me, Annie? I said. She looked back at the closet, as if she was asking it for permission to speak. Doesn't feel... real. She finally whispered. Well, Annie, 
That's because it's like spaghetti, but with eyes, and it's on fire. Her eyes were filled up with tears again. It doesn't feel real. It's like a drawing, a drawing that no one should ever draw. It doesn't feel real. Annie, have you ever considered that the squiggle doesn't feel real because it isn't actually real? What does consider mean? She asked, wiping her tears. It's when you think about something really hard, and it's when you think about something you thought was true, but you think about it really hard and you realize it's not true. The thoughts of the closet drifted from her face. She was no longer a scared child. She was a young mind trying to make sense of the world. Do you ever consider things? Yeah, I said, all the time. And does it help? When I was about your age, your grandfather used to take me to the lake every weekend. One time, while we were out swimming, he told me that there was an angry octopus that lived inside of the lake that ate little boys. So I got scared. I refused to get back into the water. And was there an octopus? No. Your grandfather was just playing a trick on me. There was never an octopus in the lake, but I... I didn't believe that. The octopus felt real to me. And after hearing my grandfather's story, I was sure I could feel the octopus in the water. I was sure he was there. But then you considered that he wasn't there, my daughter said thoughtfully. There was awe in her voice, as if I had revealed some great cosmic secret to her. You considered, and you weren't scared anymore. A bit of the summer breeze drifted in through the open window. My daughter no longer seemed scared. I felt like a good dad. Do you want to consider that maybe the squiggle is just a figment of your imagination? What's a figment? It doesn't matter. Just consider that there's no monster in your closet. Okay. She shut her eyes in concentration. For a moment she struggled with her thoughts, but then her eyes opened. And she smiled. Thank you, Daddy, she said. Outside, the sky was a chaotic smattering of stars. Somewhere off in the distance, a police siren crawled into the night. I was the only one looking at the closet. Not scared anymore? I asked. No. I consider the squiggle might not be real. And now I'm not scared. Great, I said. And got up. Good night, Annie. Good night, Daddy. She pulled her unicorn covers over herself and closed her eyes. I looked at the closet. It was covered with cartoon horse stickers that had fused themselves into the wood. The closet would forever remain covered in ponies. It perplexed me how anyone could be scared of such a harmless piece of furniture. Hey, Annie, I said, eyeing the closet handle. Do you want me to check inside the closet? She sat up in bed, confused. Why? There's nothing in there. Another rush of pride went through my lungs. The talk had gone better than expected. Well, um, for old time's sake, I said. She laughed at me as if I was ridiculous for suggesting that something might be in the closet. But she sat up in bed to get a better view. I grabbed the handle and prepared to swing the door open in a theatrical fashion, but... I couldn't. I was positive there was nothing in the closet. I knew that the squiggle was just a product of my daughter's imagination. I even found the idea of spaghetti with eyes to be a bit funny. Yet somewhere deep within me, a primal fear bubbled. I was consciously aware that the closet was empty, but there was doubt in my heart. Daddy? She asked. Are you scared? No, I said. I'm not scared. I pulled open the door and defiantly stared into the abyss of the tiny dresses and coats. For a brief moment, my rational mind took control and chastised me for being overly dramatic. But then, in the darkness of the clothes, I saw movement. I saw it. I saw that blasphemous monstrosity, which confounded my entire perception of the universe. I saw that horrid nightmare pried from the depths of God's fever dream. 
I saw the squiggle. The visage of the corroded flesh stole the blood from my face. Its sickly eyes stared deep into my soul. My knees became weak. I couldn't stand in the same world that the monstrosity existed in. The unyielding pressure of an incoming faint pushed my body off balance. Before the curtains of reality came down, I, I remember swaying towards the closet. My face became intimately familiar with one of the cartoon horse stickers my daughter had attached to the furniture. With a dull wooden thud, I lost consciousness. I awoke to the sensation of frozen peas pressed against my forehead. The lights were on. I was on the couch in the living room. Next to me sat my wife. One hand on the makeshift ice pack, the other gripped around her phone. Should I call an ambulance? She asked. No. Uh, I said, I'm, no, I'm, I'm fine. You're shaking. I was. The afterimage of the horror was still bouncing around my skull. The unexplainable madness that I had witnessed was still sending twitches through my shivering muscles. I'm, I'm fine, I repeated. What happened? My mouth felt like it was full of battery acid. There were no words to explain the ghastly fiend that I had seen hiding in my daughter's closet. I wanted to scream. I wanted to pray. I wanted to beg the heavens for some sort of an, an explanation to the cruel images that were seared into my mind. I fell, I finally said. I'm fine. Are you sure? Yes. She lifted the frozen peas off my forehead. Oh, it doesn't look like you need stitches. That's good, I said. I wasn't there. I, I wasn't sitting on my couch being tended to by my wife. I was... I was somewhere else. I was standing stark naked before a cruel world I never knew existed. A horrible blizzard of incomprehensible shapes was freezing my bones. I was a frail worm face to face with the Goliath of the Abyss. I was nothing in a world that meant me harm. And yet suddenly, past the fear, past the soul-shattering features of the abomination, something recognizable took hold. A familiar worry grasping my being. I sat up on the couch. Where's Annie? Sleeping, my wife said. I came as soon as I heard the crash. The blood from your cut scared her for a bit, but she was tucking out enough to fall asleep. I got up and I moved straight towards my daughter's bedroom. My fear of that horrid creature had not passed. With every step towards her room, my jaw clenched tighter and tighter, but my legs carried me regardless. I needed to make sure my child was safe. She was lying in bed, deep in her dreams. The unicorn covers were pulled over her face, her the closet was shut. Are you coming back to bed? My wife's touch made me flinch. I couldn't keep my eyes off the closet. There was a dark spot where my forehead met the furniture. I'm gonna... I'm gonna clean up the blood, I said. Don't wait up. Are you sure you're fine? Yes. I lied. The damp cloth from the kitchen didn't make a difference. I was too late. My blood had soaked into the cartoon horse sticker. The red splotch would be a permanent feature of my daughter's closet. It would always remind me of what I had seen. I considered whether the creature I had seen could have been a byproduct of lack of sleep, but the thought refused to take hold. The body of the creature had managed to seem both impossible and unavoidably real in the same stroke. I knew that I couldn't sleep unless I convinced myself the horror had never been real to begin with. With my mind turning faint again, I touched the handle of the closet. My vision was starting to blur. A familiar sound of static started to buzz around my ears, but I, I didn't let go of the closet door. I needed to confront reality. I needed to believe that the squiggle wasn't real. The empty closet did not lighten my heart. It simply reminded me of what I saw. It simply made the memory of that burning bush of flesh and eyes shine brighter. The squiggle ran away. She looked at me from her unicorn bed. There was a calmness in her voice which suggested the hell spawn that we had both witnessed wasn't a thing worth worrying about. You saw it? You saw that? That, that, that thing? She nodded her head. After you hit your head on the closet, it crawled over you and jumped out of the window. It crawled over me? I yelled, louder than I should have. I could hear my wife switch on the night lamp in the bedroom. Yes, 
my daughter replied, casually. The squiggle went over your tummy and out of the window. It's okay. It's not real. The thought of those wet strands of flesh crawling over my body made me feel incurably violated. My abdomen was no longer my own. It belonged to that the horrible nightmare. But you saw it. Yeah. And you're not scared? No. She said, smiling. I considered whether the squiggle was real. And now I'm brave. Like you. I wanted to grab her and tell her that she should be scared. I wanted to tell her what she saw, what, what we both saw was something that sh should inspire wails and, and despair. But her innocent smile made me turn away. Her fragile mind had made peace with the squiggle. I was the only one being haunted. Good night, Annie, I said, closing her window and locking it. Good night, Daddy, she replied, descending back into her blanket. My wife was standing in the doorway of the bedroom, concerned. I told her that I couldn't go back to sleep. I told her I... I needed to be alone. I told her I was going to go watch some television. The screens turned to static of a dead channel. The ashtray is full, the bottle half empty. We live in a universe that means us harm. We live in a, a godless world where unearthly abominations hide in little girls' closets. Regardless of how much I drink or how hard I try to rationalize, I can't, I can't, I can't convince myself otherwise. All of the windows in the house are shut and locked, but I can hear the birds starting to sing outside. A new day is starting, and I'm unable to face it. I can't carry on knowing that the, the thing is out there somewhere, crawling through the grass. I drink more, praying that the liquor will help me forget. I drink more, desperately hoping that I'll be able to convince myself that the abomination was a trick of the eye. I drink more. Knowing it won't help. It's weird, right? Whatever. Might as well check it out. Haven't seen a horror movie that's actually scared me in a while. That was the last text Lacey sent me before she went missing. I know it's irrational, but I... I hate myself for not doing something. And for not stopping her, but... How was I supposed to know? You know, how, how could I have anticipated anything that was going to happen after? The film, or whatever the hell it is, made its way into our small town like a plague only a few days ago. Twelve people bought tickets for it. Twelve people are now missing. Among them was Lacey, my girlfriend, for over two years. At the risk of sounding like that guy, our future was looking nothing but promising. We had plans. I mean, we did. Until Mr. Fucking Blank showed up. This is nowhere near a conventional missing persons case, of course. The rabbit hole goes deeper here, and honestly, the details simply don't make any sense. From what I managed to dig up, this is a general timeline of what had happened. An option to buy tickets for the film shows up at one of the three theaters in our town, which is about a 20 minute walk from my house. Only that one. And it wasn't available online. Only at the front counter of the theater itself. It wasn't supposed to be in the regular rotation. Also, none of the employees of the theater were informed about any special screenings. They simply came in and saw that it replaced a 5.30pm slot for a pre-existing film. They didn't question it because, I mean, why would they? The first and only screening is at 5.30pm on that day. I mean, the theater wasn't the busiest, but it wasn't empty either. Of course, most people opted to skip it, given the lack of any information regarding the film. But that being said, the only people who bought tickets were younger, likely curious about the odd title. The film lasted about an hour and ten minutes, with all the previews and credits considered. Pretty short for a feature, right? At 6.40pm, an employee entered the theater for cleanup duty. What he found were rows and rows of empty seats. 
Drink cups still in the holders. Popcorn littered all over the floors. No blood. No signs of a struggle. Nobody had left or entered the theater after the film had begun. Confirmation from the security cameras. The theater itself had no camera inside, so that part remains a mystery. The screen allegedly consisted of nothing but a dark static. I mean, that's what we were told, at least. I have a feeling that some details were left out from there, considering the fact that the employees in question are now missing as well, also rumored to have gone into a catatonic state after being questioned. The manager of the theater, who never greeted the employees that morning, as he usually did, was found dead in his office, with severe wounds around his neck, left from a plastic bike lock that was likely used to strangle him. And a new employee was hired about three weeks prior. The other employees described him as quiet, but a nice guy. He was working the day of the incident. You guessed it. He's missing as well. Also suspect number one in the investigation, however, they're really grasping for straws at that one. I wouldn't doubt that this employee had something to do with it, but the logistics behind the whole situation just aren't cohesive enough to make that call for sure. Some additional details. No copy of the film has been found. No progress has been made in the search for the missing people. I mean, hell, it's, it's hardly seemed like they're even trying. The local cops have been strangely hush about the whole thing, almost like they don't want people asking about it. They literally threatened to arrest me when I kept pressing them for details. There's been a lot of vehicles with tinted windows parked near the theater and surrounding areas, some even in my own community. And, well, that's the whole situation. I can't focus on anything right now. My brain's scattered and my anxiety's going through the roof. Sue me, what the hell do you expect? Lazy has to be out there somewhere, right? And how the hell is somebody just supposed to disappear into thin air? What the hell kind of film is Mr. Blank? Christ. Getting a headache just thinking about it. My initial grief's been replaced more so by confusion and anger. Might just start searching for answers myself. I won't be alone, though. Rose, Lacey's best friend, and Mike, her brother? Just as bent on figuring this out as I am. I'm not going in blind, though. In fact, I have two leads. One's more of a shot in the dark, but the other... The other should lead us somewhere concrete. I'll start off with the former. A few weeks ago, I remember my little brother telling me about a strange man he saw carved into a tree. Now, it was allegedly accompanied by messy and frantic repetitions of the word stop around it. I didn't think anything about it at the time, but I mean, it might be relevant now. Maybe not. We'll see. The other came up while I was searching for answers online. After feverishly posting about the film on what I considered to be relevant forums and yielding no answers, somebody finally messaged me about it, claiming that they had information that I might like to know. And luckily, they're only a three-hour drive from here, and they're willing to meet me halfway. Is this a bad idea? Probably. Am I going to like what I find? Probably not. But the thought of Lacey being out there and God knows what kind of fucked up situation. I just can't take it. I'm not letting it end like this. And we're off. The person who'd messaged me, online name ScreenGrabber22, told me to call him Jay. And he's agreed to meet up at a diner in a town about an hour away from us, two away from him. He seemed genuine enough while I was talking to him online, but intentions can be hard to ascertain over text. With short, still worth a shot, I guess. I'll do anything to figure this out. Mike was all in from the get-go. I suppose I felt safer with him around, given the fact that he stood at about six foot two and 200 plus pounds, boosting a 650 pound deadlift. Obviously, he didn't like the idea that something had happened to his sister. I mean, hell, I had to stay on my toes just to stop him from knocking me out when he found out that Lacey and I were first dating. He was also pissed as hell at both of his parents for being so complacent about the situation and the, the cops for not yielding any results. On the other hand, Rose was wary about the situation at first. I couldn't blame her, really. This shit was weird. 
But at the end of the day, we all really wanted to find Lacey. Enough so to venture off into what was, ostensibly, a dangerous unknown. The drive was uneventful, which I suppose was a good thing. I had a feeling that the humdrum nature of our little trip wasn't going to last, though. What a seedy-ass place. Mike stated as he stepped out of the vehicle. I couldn't disagree. Flickering fluorescent lights, peeling paint, and a nearly empty parking lot. A place that truly hadn't caught up with the times. Guy's probably bullshitting about knowing anything, Mike continued. If he got us out here to try something, I'll blow off some steam by stomping his shit in. I expected nothing less from him. Anything to find Lacey, but don't do anything stupid. I know you're gonna, Bruce said, before taking the lead and heading towards the entrance. Hey, wait up! Mike called out, running after her. I took a deep breath before following suit. This was happening. We were taking matters into our own hands. The place was sparsely populated inside, about six other people in total. Green hoodie, black hat, I muttered to myself. Jay's outfit of choice, apparently. Didn't take long to spot him. I was relatively relieved upon realizing that he was on the younger side. He looked slightly older than us, probably early 20s, late teens. Nothing terribly noteworthy about his appearance. A skinny guy with medium-length, dirty blonde hair. Jay? I asked, approaching his table. When he looked up, I realized that there was something off about him. His eyes. They looked a little... unhinged? Low-key, though. That's a strong way of describing it, I guess, but there's a reason why that was the first word that popped into my head when my pupils met his. He gave me a slight smile before awkwardly gesturing for us to sit. So, he said, taking a sip of his coffee. His movements were rather jittery. You want to know about the movie? We all nodded at once. He let out a weird noise, like something halfway between a sneer and a cough. But why? How do you even know about it to begin with? Does it matter why? Mike spoke up. We just want to know. Don't tell me you're just about to waste our time. He tended to get quite dramatic sometimes. I'll tell you what you need to know, Jay said after a few moments of silence. All right, get on with it. You guys need to drop it. Stop thinking about it. Christ, Mike said. What the hell did I just say? I'm not wasting your time, Jay responded. I'm saving your lives. Just as Mike seemed to be reaching his wit's end, which wasn't hard to get to, mind you, Rose chimed in. What do you mean? She said. Look, our friend went missing. We're not leaving without something, please. Her tone was a lot softer, which seemed to calm Jay down. I'm sorry that happened, he said. But I don't think you're going to find her. Son of a bitch, Mike said, slamming the table. Jay flinched at the action. Look, I've given you the best advice I can. Just leave it alone. If that's the case, you wouldn't have agreed to meet up. There's clearly something that you feel we should know, I said. No, Jay shook his head. If I left it like that, you would have kept digging deeper. I called you here to convince you to let it go. Not gonna happen, Mike said. So either you tell us something, or you say goodbye to your teeth. Ignore him, I chimed in. But you gotta tell us something, okay? Like, what the hell Mr. Blank is supposed to be? I was getting desperate. My hopes had been spiked, perhaps to an unreasonably high degree, but I still wasn't prepared to just leave it at that. I needed something. I could see Jay's bottom lip quiver just slightly upon hearing the question. He's... He muttered. It looked as if he could hardly muster up an answer. He looked terrified, which in turn terrified me. At one point, it seemed as if he were about to cry, but he took a deep breath, seemingly calming himself down. So you guys aren't going to let this go? I shook my head. How are we supposed to? He clicked his tongue in a frustrated tone. His previous face of distress had morphed into something more comparable to anger, as if the whole situation was beginning to bother him something great. 
Okay, uh, okay, I, I guess you forced my hand. He whispered something under his breath. It sounded relatively aggressive. Truth be told, Jay's reservation towards the situation was only spiking my interest even more. What was he so afraid of? He gestured towards the exit. Follow me, then. I'll show you something. He was nearly a mutter. Follow you, I thought. All right, then. I'm not a total idiot. Okay, the red flags were sticking out like sore thumbs, but at the end of the day, I suppose this is exactly what we were asking for. In my pocket, I gripped the stiletto knife from Italy that Lacey had gotten me a few months back. Just in case, you know. With all of us on high alert, we walked out of the diner and began following Jay's beat-up jeep. The subsequent drive wasn't long, probably only three or four minutes, an inherent symptom of small towns, I guess. He led us to a small motel. Looked kind of dingy, but not terribly so. Nevertheless, it was another cause for concern. He only lived two hours away. Why stay the night? He sighed as he exited his vehicle, gesturing us up the stairs. He ascended three floors and walked past a few doors before arriving in his room. Mike and Rose walked in first, and I followed. Big mistake. So, what do you want to- Before I could even finish my sentence, my vision went black. I'm not sure how long I was knocked out for, but... When I came to, I was lying on the couch, nursing a splitting headache. Yo, he's awake. Mike's booming voice felt like a hammer to my brain. I looked up and saw he was holding Jay in a headlock. There was a baseball bat lying a few feet away from them. Rose was standing at the foot of the couch, looking relieved that I wasn't dead. Oh, thank God, she said. You won't be thanking anybody once he shows up. I'm trying to save you, fucking idiots. Jay rasped out, struggling for air. What happened wasn't exactly a mystery. Jay had tried taking my head off with a damn bat. With my brain still reeling, I pulled myself off the couch and approached him, all while he struggled against Mike's python-like arms. So, I said still wincing, what the fuck was that? Jay's face was starting to go beet red, so I gestured for Mike to loosen his grip. He started panting like hell upon being released. Who the hell is Mr. Blank? I asked. I'll ask you one more time, or do you want to explain to the cops why the hell you just fucking assaulted me? His expression had changed drastically. Not so angry anymore, he looked more... defeated. I tried, he said in a hoarse voice. Tried to do what? To save you people. To save me. So what the hell was your plan? Knock us out and then what? I don't know, he said nearly in hysterics. I panicked. Didn't know what to do, but I had to get you guys to stop somehow. You forced me to. I get it now, Mike said. You're a crazy guy. We've been talking to a psycho. Good job, guys. Is that it? I thought to myself. Are we just wasting our time talking to a guy who clearly gone off the deep end? I wasn't so sure. I had encounters with criminally insane people before. My father had worked security at a psych ward. And I had visited him there a few times before. This guy, he just didn't fit the bill. I suppose his words sounded genuine. Of course, I couldn't know for sure, so I remained cautious. Jay slumped against the wall, tilting his head back against it. I never could escape him, he said. I don't think anybody ever does. Who? I asked, already expecting the answer I was about to receive. He looked over at me directly. <laughs> Mr. Blank. His voice quivered. It seemed as if merely saying his name caused him a great deal of discomfort. I don't know where he come from. What he even is. He kept quiet as he talked. We were finally getting what we came here for. He's incomprehensible. Imagine the worst, most visceral nightmare you ever had. That's nothing compared to an encounter with him. You can't outrun him, you can't kill him, you can't deal with him in any way. And once he's after you, he won't stop. You just have to pray that you never meet him. A look of absolute grief suddenly washed over his face. But it's too late now. You fried too hard. He's, he's already on his way. You want to elaborate on that? I asked. He smirked at the question. 
It was one that unsettled me to my core. The smile wasn't one of joy or relief, not even close. It was more comparable to a smile that somebody in great pain would make upon learning that their misery would soon be coming to an end. Shouldn't have spoken his name again. I guess it doesn't matter. It was the end of the line for me. Suddenly, as if a man possessed, he drilled his elbow into Mike's ribs and began scrambling away from him. He barreled past me and into the washroom, and before I could even try to stop him myself, he locked himself in there. Shit, I muttered, began banging on the bathroom door. The hell are you doing? I tried talking some sense into you. This is my punishment for failing. What are you talking about? Come on, we'll figure it out. I can't deal with what's happening next, he said through the wood. My nightmares end here. I'll pray that your suffering ends up being less than mine. I'll pray for your friend as well. I suggest you do the same. Come on, don't, don't do anything stupid. Too late. I heard his body slump to the ground moments later. When he finally got the door open, Jay was lying limp on the floor with an empty, unlabeled pill bottle beside him. Fucking hell, Mike said. Jeez, Rose added, looking understandably horrified. What the hell do we do now? Do we call the cops or something? Fuck no, Mike replied. I'm not dealing with that. Let them find the guy themselves. He overdosed. Simple as that. He turned to me. Not bleeding, are you? I touched the back of my head. Dry. I shook my head. No. Good. No blood. No suspicion, Mike said. Let's get the hell out of here, then. It's not how it works. We also busted the bathroom door down. Remember? I said. He seemed to think for a moment before coming to his final profound conclusion. <laughs> Fuck it. I had my own reservations about leaving the situation the way that it was, but Mike was already out the door before I could even say anything else. In the moment, there was nothing I could do but follow him. I mean, call it selfish, but the situation was beyond helping at that point. If you ask me, I felt somewhat responsible for Jay's death. But if you asked me if I felt somewhat responsible for Jay's death, then I would have answered in the affirmative. The feeling in my stomach as we walked to the car, it wasn't a good one. The drive back was relatively silent. We'd gotten next to no answers, had a hell of a lot more questions, and had just witnessed a fucking suicide. On top of that, there was somebody following us. I don't think either Mike or Rose had noticed it. The driver was doing a good job of being discreet after all. Suddenly I remember the sketchy vehicle that had been parked around town. I looked back at the vehicle and yup, tinted windows. I don't think I'm going to tell them. Nerves are really high. Abrupt panic probably isn't going to help us here. One thing's for sure though. This situation has gotten a lot more complicated. Is this asshole really following us? Unfortunately, they noticed. Shit, I muttered. This wasn't good. Nevertheless, both Mike and Rose were being rational about it. I mean, although they were both visibly worried, they seemed to understand that freaking out wasn't going to help. Ignore them, I said. If they keep following us once we get into town, then I'll call the cops. Hang on, Rose began. You don't think they saw us leaving the apartment, do you? Probably did. Why? Stupid question on my part. They totally left a dead guy in there. Shit, Mike shouted upon realizing, maybe it's the cops themselves tailing us. That's so dumb for so many reasons, Rose responded. Why would cops be following us to begin with? Who the hell knows what cops are thinking? They can't pin it on us, right? We didn't do anything. They don't know that. They can argue that we forcibly shoved the pills down his throat and left. Why would we do that? I don't know, Rose. Why the hell does anybody do anything? All right, fucking relax. I raised my voice just a bit. They aren't cops, Mike. That's ridiculous. Okay, cop expert. Then who is it? Mike responded. I didn't have an answer. But I knew one thing was probably for sure. Whoever was following us was probably... Worse news than the police. Try and shake them off. Mike told me. 
Yeah, no way in hell. I'm not a fucking stunt driver. As I had hoped, the vehicle trailed off once we got into town. As much as I appreciated the initial relief, this just meant that we had another thing to worry about. Another lingering issue. I thought back to the unfamiliar cars with tinted windows that had been parked around town. I didn't think about it too much in the moment, but the vehicle that had been tailing us had also been tinted. Shit, I thought. This whole situation's getting a, a bit too complicated for my liking. Not that this was an enjoyable experience to begin with. We parked at a nearby gas station, not wanting to reveal where any of us lived just yet. I still couldn't quite shake the feeling that we were being followed after all. Of course, Mike was against this. These motherfuckers probably know where we live already, he said. I say, let them come. My shotgun needs a good dusting off. Okay, calm down there, Rambo, Rose replied. Before you get yourself killed, let's come up with a plan, an actual plan. We ended up driving over to Mike's apartment after a few uneventful hours, but before we could come up with anything at all, Mike and Rose ended up passing out. I had no idea how they found it in themselves to sleep. After everything that had happened, I simply couldn't. Paranoia was also starting to creep up on me, causing me to constantly check the street to see if anybody was out there waiting for us. But as the night went on, nobody showed up. Either that or they were... They were doing a hell of a good job at being discreet. But eventually, I succumbed to fatigue myself. I woke up next to the windows, the sun stinging my eyes. Mike was cooking up breakfast sausages and Pop-Tarts in the kitchen. Breakfast of champions, I suppose. Okay, Mike said, through a mouthful of pork. Last night was bunk. What's next? I suppose it was time for a shot in the dark. The forest. Mike and Rose weren't too enthused on the idea. I, mean, I could hardly blame them. However, our options were running relatively slim. No other avenues to really investigate. Graffiti in the forest. They're getting desperate, huh? Mike sighed, putting his head down. But he got up after a few moments, grabbing for his jacket. Desperate it is. I never really liked the forest. The place always spooked me as a kid. I mean, I can't say I'm too fond of it as an adult either. It just feels so claustrophobic. You know? Surrounded by dead trees, but exposed at every conceivable angle. Maybe I'm just weird. I tried to suppress those thoughts when we walked in. Where'd your brother say he found it? Rose asked. Near the creek. Very specific, Mike said. And what the hell are we supposed to do when we find it? I don't know. Maybe we'll find a clue somewhere. The words came out of my mouth with zero confidence. And it was obvious. What the hell kind of clue are we supposed to be looking for? As we continued walking, we passed the time by contemplating what Mr. Blank might be. A serial killer? Perhaps we needed to look at it from a supernatural angle. Some kind of monster. Demon, maybe. But what was its connection to the theater? The whole situation was maddening to think about. I mean, nothing made any sense. After about 20 minutes of inspecting each and every tree near the creek, we finally found it. The carvings that my brother was talking about. Huh. Mike commented on seeing it. Pretty spooky. And I couldn't disagree. It was more or less the way that my brother had described it. Very strange indeed. It was difficult to make out any real features of the man depicted in the carving. I, I mean, I guess it was a man. Humanoid, at the very least. It appeared to be tall, wearing some kind of long, sweeping coat. It was a strange pattern covering the torso, almost looking like... bones. Hard to tell, given the nature of what we were looking at. And then there was the head. No facial features. Blank, if you will. And of course, it was accompanied by the word stop, scribbled all over. I could only describe the nature of the writing as distressed. Was it just a coincidence? I doubted that. What the hell are we getting into here? I heard Mike mutter under his breath. I looked over at Rose, trying to gauge her reaction as well. She certainly looked frightened, as expected, but not in the same way that Mike was. The fear on her face appeared... Well, it appeared to stem from a more urgent matter. 
you guys? She began asking. Don't panic, but I'm pretty sure somebody's following us. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I realized something. We'd been careless. Even though we were being tailed last night, we didn't bother carrying that caution over to this morning. And hell, I didn't even look over my shoulder when we first walked into the forest. Mike clicked his tongue loudly, looking agitated. Okay, asshole, come out! He shouted. Jesus, Mike! Rose and I said in unison. I don't want to draw this out. He reached into his back pocket and pulled out a pistol. Gotta come prepared. Learned that yesterday, didn't we? The next few moments comprised of a tense silence. Well, maybe not. See, I'm not... I'm pretty sure everybody could hear my heart beating out of my chest. All right. I flinched as a deeper voice called out from an indistinguishable location. Suppose there's no point in keeping this up. I see you have a gun, kid. I'm coming out. So don't shoot. I could see movement within the maze of trees. Mike clicked the safety off and aimed the weapon right towards the general area it was coming from. Are you stupid? He said. Also, I'm 24. Don't fucking call me a kid. Whoever had been following us didn't hesitate, continuing towards us. It's not like your age makes you any less of a kid. I've known 13-year-olds I'd already consider men, given what they've been through. The voice eventually revealed itself. He looked to be in his early 30s, dressed in a windbreaker and well-tailored dress pants. He was about a head shorter than Mike. Wavy hair, clean-shaven face, and a world-weary look in his eyes. There was also a substantial scar running down his left cheek, but beyond that, he's pretty much one of the best-looking guys I've ever seen in my life. Not an important detail, but, you know, whatever. You're not going to shoot me, kid. So why don't you stop pretending like you ever considered it? He said in just about the most confident tone I'd ever heard in my life. Mike gripped the pistol, the veins bulging in his hands. Don't push your luck. I'll introduce myself, he said, ignoring the threat. He reached into his coat pocket, which made Mike flinch, and pulled out a pretty official-looking FBI badge and identification card. His name was Fenn. His thumb was covering up his last name. Maybe it was a conscious decision. I'm not really concerned with whether or not you believe my credentials. But I'm curious. What are you kids doing out here? Why the hell should we tell you? Mike asked, still trying to sound assertive. Sven sighed before looking at Rose. Darling, could you please ask your friend to put the gun down? He's gonna hurt himself. He looked back at Mike. Keep it in your hand if it makes you feel safer, though. Rose obliged, nudging Mike. Come on, she whispered. It's not going to end well. Mike mumbled something angrily before obliging himself. Sven nodded and smirked. Now, regarding my question, what's the deal here? He certainly pretended like he didn't already know. The missing people, I said. I'm sure you're familiar with the rest of the details, probably more so than we are. He nodded before looking down. Yeah, it's a strange case. Mike scoffed. Strange. My sister's missing. If you know what the fuck's going on, then tell us. He looked back up at us, an inquisitive expression on his face. Maybe that's something I'm trying to figure out myself. And that's when he dropped the bombshell on us. He wasn't actually here on official business. He was essentially after the same thing we were. This wasn't the first instance of Mr. Blank causing somebody to disappear. His fiancée, Sarah, had gone missing a few years prior. Hauntingly similar circumstances. He tried looking into it, but his higher-ups told him to stray away and wouldn't give him any information or leads. Mr. Blank was an utterly classified topic. Ever since then, he'd been chasing after answers, trying to unravel this obscure mystery, but not with much luck. However, there was an opportunity here. This was the first time that Mr. Blank had ever made an appearance since his fiancée went missing, without telling any of his fellow agents, and without the discretion of the higher-ups. He'd come here to conduct his own investigations, all while attempting to stay hidden from the agents already posted here. 
Mm, the tented vehicles, I muttered. That's why they're here? Yep, he said. Duh. They don't want anyone prying. Probably for the best. But for obvious reasons, I can't stay away. Yeah, likewise, I said. So it was you following us last night. He raised an eyebrow before shaking his head. Sounds like you've caught their attention. Oh, shit. Then why are you following us now? Rose asked. He looked at Mike. You're Mike Karen, right? Mike gave him a slight nod. Lacey Karen was one of the people that went missing. I was aware of the whole thing. I took a shot, assuming that you'd try doing something about it. When I saw you guys leave town yesterday, I got even more curious. I couldn't have followed without giving myself away, though. So I kept an eye on your apartment. And then, you walked into the forest first thing in the morning. Interesting behavior for sure, so prove my intuition right. What do you know? Because I'd love to know as well. His tone had taken an intense turn. It was pretty obvious that he was driven by passion, which I could understand. Even if mine was to far less of a degree than his. Truth be told, we really don't have much, I told him. I felt embarrassed even considering showing him the tree carving as some kind of evidence. Perhaps my passion really was clouding my judgment. Maybe we really were just grasping at fucking straws here. But then Sven took a look at it himself. I expected him to scoff, possibly make a sarcastic comment to the effect of, good job guys, you really cracked the case here. But instead of doing that, he began studying the carving rather intently. And after a few minutes... He reached into his pocket and took out his phone. Look familiar, he said, showing it to us. After nearly gagging at the initial sight, I had to admit that it was. A tall humanoid, sweeping coat, skeleton torso, blank face. This time it was drawn in blood on a dirty basement wall. There was also a man with his entrails leaking out, kneeling down towards it. Oh, fuck, I muttered, trying to hide how much I was shivering. You sure you're supposed to be showing us that? I'm not supposed to be doing a lot of stuff right now, Sven replied. But here we are. What the hell is it? A crime scene? Sven nodded. Two and a half years ago, about the same time Sarah went missing. Don't know the details because I wasn't there. Risked everything to get my hands on this. Despite how gruesome it was, the crime scene pretty much confirmed that there was some kind of connection here. But the question remained. What now? Where do we go from here? Guys? Rose spoke up. Check it out. She pointed to another tree up ahead, maybe about 20 feet away. Could it be? I thought approaching it. It was. A similar carving had been scribbled into it. The same figure, the same word. I began scanning the area once again. There was another tree, a bit away farther this time, and then another one, and another one. The four of us began following the carving as like a trail of breadcrumbs, right towards what had to be the culprit behind him. We didn't even hesitate. Didn't stop to ask questions. We were driven by sheer impulse at the revelation, but clearly... Sven was paying more attention than us. After a few minutes, I felt him put a hand on my shoulder. Wait, he said. What? Why? You have a gun, don't you? I mean, so does Mike. We'll be fine. Not that, he said. Look forward. But stay calm. And then I saw it. There was something up ahead. A large figure doing a poor job of hiding behind a thin tree. I could see a large, pale, bony hand twitching erratically as it drooped near the ground. A quiet but shrill noise suddenly began to fill the air around us, like a combination of high-pitched radio frequencies and some kind of deranged laugh. I suddenly remembered what Jay had told us before he died. He's already on his way. I was frozen. 
absolutely, unequivocally frozen. I can only describe the fear that gripped me as visceral. Like I was drowning in a freezing lake of incomprehensible dread. Unprepared to face what was ahead of me in the slightest. I looked at Sven, the most capable one out of us, but even he looked petrified, face drained of any color. I looked back at the trees, watching as the pale, gargantuan creature wrapped its disturbing hand entirely around the tree. The high-pitched radio frequency laugh continued around us, seemingly growing louder and louder by the second, and then out of nowhere, it stopped. What are you looking at? A deep, slimy, penetrating voice assaulting my ears. It nearly sounded like it was coming from my own head. I flinched, taking my eyes off the entity behind the tree for just a moment. It was gone when I looked back up. Seth? I heard Rose call my name out. I whipped my head around, nearly passing out in fear upon seeing what was behind me. It was him. Blank face, skeletal torso, giant bony hands leering down right at me, only a few inches away. Without even thinking, I began running. I turned my back after a few seconds, watching as the creature's body twisted and contorted, turning into a massive spider-human hybrid with tens of pale, veiny limbs crawling toward me. I, I nearly threw up right there. Sven drew his pistol and began shooting. Due to how erratically it was moving, he missed every shot except for one, which drilled straight through the creature's head, causing a wave of thick black blood to burst out from either side of its temple. It went limp immediately, with its limbs crumpling and falling to the ground. For a moment, I suppose I was relieved, but then... Then I realized what kind of monster we were dealing with. The laughing had come back, louder than ever now. That hurt. I blinked once and the corpse had disappeared, and then I noticed a hulking shadow looming somewhere next to me. I looked over, watching as the creature, now back in its humanoid skeleton form, wrapped one of its hands around Sven's neck. With the other one, it grabbed out of its wrist, instantaneously crushing it into a bloody pulp. As Sven grunted in agony, the creature turned to look directly at me. The bottom half of its face began to distort, and soon enough, a human mouth emerged from underneath its skin. If I was close to puking before, I couldn't help myself now. I retched before looking back up to see it smiling at me. Not only that, the smile was familiar. Soft, pink lips, glowing white teeth that were just slightly crooked at the bottom. It was... Lacey's smile. What are you doing, Seth? Come find me. Her voice was unmistakable. I heard myself whimper. I blinked one more time and it disappeared again. Sven dropped to the ground, still grimacing at his gruesome injury. Mike and Rose were in abject shock. I could feel tears begin swelling up in my eyes. Start running. Again, the voice came from elsewhere and nowhere at once. I began hearing what sounded like heavy, animalistic movements approaching fast. I turned around, seeing something barreling towards us. It looked comparable in appearance to a gorilla with dark fur, but with about three times as many limbs, running at us like an oversized centipede, and of course, a familiar blank face at the front. He wasn't even giving me time to grieve. Safe to say, we took the advice and we bolted the hell the other way. Every time that I looked back to see if it had finally caught up, the creature always looked like it was moving at an unfathomable pace, yet it always remained the same distance behind us. After a while of this, it, it really felt like I was losing my own grip on reality. As we began reaching the edge of the forest, I remember my vision beginning to blur. I passed out likely due to a combination of exhaustion, fear, and agony upon hearing Lacey's voice and seeing her lips on that fucking monster. I woke up back in Mike's apartment. Clothes dirty, cold sweat running down my forehead and my joints aching like hell. It had become dark outside. I suppose I'd been out for a while. Mike and Rose were sitting on the other couch, neither saying a word or even looking up. Can't really blame them. I suppose not after an experience like that. Where's Sven? I finally asked. He left. He drove off. He said he had to do something urgent. Rose answered after a few moments. Never even went to the hospital before leaving town. I don't think he's coming back. Guess we 
We aren't getting any more help from them, I thought to myself. I decided to stay at my parents' place for a bit. I mean, they were happy to see me, but I wasn't really there emotionally. I mean, I hated to admit it, but the whole encounter had taken a lot out of me. As much as I still wanted to somehow save Lacey, I... I couldn't stand the idea of facing that thing again. I needed time to overcome my fears, time to recover before looking for any more answers. But Mr. Blank wouldn't even let me do that. For the first few nights, everything was normal. I used some of my vacation days to get off work, and I spent my time watching TV, playing games, trying to motivate myself to stop being so scared and, and go looking for her again. That wasn't working so well. I was so petrified at the very thought of it. But after a few nights, the tapping started. It sounded like a bony finger rapping on my window during the dead of night. I never bothered looking, of course. When I didn't react to it, Mr. Blank began fucking with me in more severe ways. I'd see a hulking shadow behind my shower curtain seconds after I'd stepped in, a pair of legs sticking out from underneath my bed as I was getting ready to sleep. An unwanted passenger in the backseat of my vehicle at night. Employees following me around grocery stores, and staring at me in restaurants. I never could make out any of their facial features. It was all starting to take a heavy toll on my mind. I mean, I could feel my sanity slipping away by the hour. I called Mike and Rose. Same story. Rose's voice was monotonous, devoid of any kind of emotion. Mike sounded like... He was on the verge of tears. But what made everything infinitely worse was the knowledge that at any point he or... Or it... Could kill me in a split second. So that begged the question, why didn't it? What was the point of fucking with me like this? And it all came to a boiling point when I was grabbing my mail. As I was getting ready to reach in, a bloody hand poked out of my mailbox and handed me my envelopes. How generous. It was all starting to become rather bothersome. I mean, I freaked out right then and there. Fuck you, I screamed. What the fuck do you want from me? I grabbed the door of the mailbox and slammed it into the hand until I heard bones beginning to break, and for the first time in a while, fear wasn't my dominant emotion. It was, it was anger. After enduring the punishment, the hand eventually retreated. I bent down, staring directly into the now empty slot. You where the fuck is Lacey, asshole? My screams were beginning to attract the attention of my neighbors. Not that I cared. I could hardly keep my frustration in at that point. I had to let it out. Why don't you just kill me? Huh? I guess I'll fucking find and kill you first! I hardly believed in what I was saying. The words were simply pouring out of my mouth. I slammed the door shut. I stormed back into my house. I took some time for self-reflection. The cops had told me to let it go from the start. I mean, hell, even my own parents were telling me that. So why hadn't I? Why couldn't I just let it go? Maybe it's because I hadn't lost hope. I mean, for one reason or another, I still believed that I could get Lacey back. That I could somehow overcome this horrific, seemingly impossible enemy. And come out victorious in the end. And after all, if Mr. Blank could imitate Lacey's voice, then it meant that she was still alive, right? Perhaps that was a stretch, but I didn't allow myself to believe that. It'd be comparable to admitting defeat right then and there. There was also another thing driving me forward. If I didn't face it head on, this thing was never going to leave me alone. I remembered what I'd told myself in the beginning, that I wasn't going to let it end like this. Whenever I'd backed down from a conflict before, my father always told me to grow a pair of balls and man up. It made me hate him at times. But suddenly that seemed like Rather sound advice. I spent the next few days getting off my ass and preparing to head into the forest. I was going to keep following the tree carvings. Our only real lead, wherever that may lead me. 
it was pretty obvious that physical attacks weren't bringing this thing down. I mean, hell, I wasn't even trying to kill it. I needed information first, like, like where the hell it was keeping Lacey. However, physical wounds did seem to bother it, in some marginal capacity at the very least. While I was brainstorming, I noticed something else as well. Ever since the mailbox incident, the bastard had left me alone. My first act of defiance against it. There had to be a correlation there. I decided to call Mike and Rose again. They still sounded frightened. Defeated. Mr. Blank was still going after them. What did this mean? I only had my theories, of course. Nevertheless, they were theories worth testing. I began putting together my own mini arsenal. My dad's pistol. One of Mike's shotguns that I'd borrowed a few weeks back. A, a hunting knife. Baseball bat for good measure. Was I trained in armed or unarmed combat? Fuck no. Still had a puncher's chance, though. I decided to head back into the forest exactly one week after I'd first gone in. I'd made my preparations, of course. Wrote a letter from my parents, in case I didn't come back. A letter from Mike. One for Rose. Didn't even bother asking them to come. They sounded like they weren't even ready to leave their rooms while I talked to them last. I wasn't quite sure what to put in the letters. I just felt obligated to write them. An explanation, I suppose. Before heading out of my house, I slugged back one swig of whiskey, two cups of coffee. I tried to calm my nerves. It didn't really work. Didn't matter. Before I knew it, I was standing back at the edge of the tree line. Alone. I took a step. A deep breath. Another step. Oh shit. The nerves had come back. One more step. My legs began shaking. It's as if the fear I'd been suppressing began rushing back to me all at once. I looked up and something caught my eye. A large figure obscured by the woods, creeping along my line of vision. A familiar hand wrapped around one of the trees, dangling a severed hand by the pinky. Sven's hand, most likely. It was taunting me. Every fiber of my being was telling me to turn back and run the fuck away. And I nearly did just that. I was petrified. But that didn't mean I could stop. This thing wasn't going to stop following me at the forest. It knew where I lived. It knew how to push my buttons, how to get under my skin. It knew nearly everything about me. I was too deep into this mess already. Face my fears, deal with it myself, or end up like Jay and leave Lacey trapped in whatever hell she was currently in. With that in my mind, I took another deep breath, and I began walking right towards it. And as I suspected, it disappeared shortly after. Like I somehow scared it off. Even though that probably wasn't the case. I smiled to myself, reveling at the idea. From there, I began following the carvings, retracing our steps from a week prior, but I was planning on getting farther this time. As expected, Mr. Blank didn't leave me alone after I'd entered. In fact, I was pretty much on my toes the entire time. About five minutes in, I heard something breathing down the back of my neck. I remember what had happened to Sven and immediately pivoted sideways. At that point, it was, it was the closest I'd ever gotten to it. This time, it had taken a gargoyle-esque form, wings and all. I pulled out my pistol. I fired about four shots at it. I mean, I never had great aim, so one bullet even grazed it. But I think my message was sent, because it disappeared with a blink immediately afterward. It hurled its share of auditory torments toward me as well, screaming horrible things at me in generic demonic voices. The only time these really affected me was when... when I was imitating Lacey. God, this guy was really pissing me off. It appeared two more times before it finally managed to hurt me. However, the attack was awkward. It obviously could have killed me at this point, yet it seemed bent on trying to give me only non-lethal injuries. Nevertheless, it succeeded. Have you, have you ever seen fan art of the rake? You know, that classic creepypasta story. Well, that's what it turned into. 
with only no face. It managed to slash my thighs. I mean, not a deep cut, but I mean, it still hurt like hell. I responded by breaking my bat over its head. Even though doing so caused it to disappear, it was a move I regretted instantly. I lost one of my close quarter weapons. I mean, I used to play baseball, but I'd never used a knife for anything beyond chopping onions. I calmed down by telling myself that at the very least, it wasn't going to kill me. Boy, was I wrong there. After about only a minute, it crawled out of the dirt in the form of a familiar, machete-wielding, zombie-wearing hockey mask and nearly took my head off. I managed to dodge the swing by a hair, and the tree beside me was sliced clean in half. I guess Mr. Blank was something of a cinemaphile. I suppose that made sense. It didn't look non-lethal to me, I thought to myself. I scrambled to pull out my shotgun, and I blew off the wannabe Jason's head. However, it took me both shots to do so, and I wasn't very fast at reloading. Mr. Blank suddenly appeared behind me, now a hulking, faceless clown, carrying what looked like a lead bowling pin. At that moment, I was defenseless. It swung the pin, breaking the shotgun in half as I attempted to defend myself with it. And after that, I started running. What the fuck was I thinking? This, this asshole could basically teleport. It suddenly stepped out from a tree in front of me. This time, it had turned into one of the nurses from Silent Hill, bolting at me with a rusty knife. Fuck, I shouted. It looked like Mr. Blank wasn't pulling any more punches. It caused me to experience a new kind of fear, not, not dread or, or vague fear of the unknown. It was fear of immediate and certain death. But at the same time, I could feel the adrenaline pumping through my veins. I tried convincing myself that I was ready. Knowing that I couldn't run, I pulled out my own knife, and I tried bracing myself. This is gonna fucking hurt, I thought to myself. And as I got within a few feet of me, the crack of a heavy shotgun caused me to flinch. The nurse was subsequently sawed in half at the torso, with stray fragments of buckshot littering the tree beside me. Jesus, what the fuck? I shouted, panting like hell at the same time. Hey boy, let's not be taking the Lord's name in vain there. A familiar voice. Heavy southern twang. We, we weren't anywhere near the south. I looked over, seeing two wholly unexpected figures. One was Sven with heavy bandages wrapped around his wrist. He wasn't the one that fired the shot, though. Standing next to him was a tall, bulky man with messy blonde hair, wearing what looked like a heavy tactical jacket and camo hunting pants. He was carrying a massive, industrial-looking shotgun, certainly not anything police-grade. And hell, it didn't even look like something the military would use. Anyways, it's your lucky day, man said, slinging the weapon over his shoulder. Sven looked at me and smiled. I told your friend I was coming back, he said. I don't think she believed me, though. He looked at his shotgun-wielding friend. So, what do you think? Told you I had something big. The man chuckled, watching as the nurse corpse disappeared into thin air, just as every one of Mr. Blank's forms tended to do. Well, I'll be, he said, smiling to himself. The strange one for sure. No matter. I'm itching for a good old-fashioned battle. What the... What the hell? It's the only thing I could muster out, given how truly bizarre the circumstances had become. Hush up there, the man said, aiming his shotgun at something behind me. Looks like it's itching for the same battle. I turned around, watching as a Michael Myers dropped down from the tree, only he wasn't carrying a kitchen knife. He had a damn chainsaw. It looked like Mr. Blank was getting his films mixed up. Asking any more questions seemed like a lost cause, and in any case, I needed to focus on the task at hand. Staying alive? Well, searching for Lacey. But it looks like I have some much needed help now. Can't complain about that. God damn, this freak sure is something. The man with the shotgun seemed to be having a little bit too much fun. He'd killed Mr. Blank three more times. However, it was becoming more of a close call with every encounter. Who is this guy? I called out to Sven. Uh, Jimmy, an old friend. I hunt weird shit for sport, Jimmy said in the midst of reloading his shotgun, a ferocious gaze on his face. But don't boil me down to just that. I like a lot of stuff. What kind of stuff, I thought to myself. Well, I guess it didn't really matter. I came to a realization. Mr. Blank had his hands full with Jimmy, which meant I had a chance. I bolted up and I began running. Call it a selfish move, I hardly cared at that point. Shotgun blasts rocked the space around me as I ran, following the obscure tree carving towards an unknown destination. I couldn't tell you what I was expecting to find. I didn't even know if there was going to be anything waiting for me at all. And nevertheless, I ran. And I never considered stopping. 
The whole journey took me a little longer than I expected. I'd gotten deep into the forest before the carvings had disappeared altogether. This is it, I thought, feverishly looking around for something, but what the hell was I looking for? After a while of searching, I finally spotted a clue. Another carving. But not on a tree this time. It was on a large rock, right beside what appeared to be a small opening leading to a cave within. Not ominous in the slightest. Jeez, am I really going in there? I thought to myself. By all accounts, nothing would lead a rational person to enter such a space. Nevertheless, I was far more rational at that point. I'd also stopped hearing the shotgun blast a while ago. That can only mean that Mr. Blank was about to be on my ass once again. I took a deep breath and stepped forward into whatever the hell was awaiting me in the darkness. The cave itself, if you want to call it that. It was more comparable to a large hole than a rock. It was larger on the inside than it looked on the outside, but not drastically. It was still relatively tight as I traversed into it. For the first few seconds, I could make out nothing but darkness, but it didn't take too long to find what I'd unknowingly been searching for this whole time. There was a light ahead, like one derived from a small flame, and it was moving. Somebody or something was holding it up. Making out any details from the angle and distance I was standing at wasn't quite possible, so I was forced to move forward if I wanted my answers. So, you've come for me, huh? It wasn't the kind of voice I expected, not low, guttural, or menacing in the slightest. Whoever was speaking sounded meek, terrified, on the verge of tears. But first impressions can deceive. I stayed on my toes, preparing myself for anything. From everything I had experienced so far, anything was certainly possible. What do you mean? I asked in a low voice, as to not to trigger any sudden aggression. How did you find me? The man asked. Oh, he paused. The carvings led you right to me, I suppose. The man turned, his face partially illuminated by a large candle he was holding, dangerously close to his skin. I could hardly make out any distinguishable features. His hair was long and scraggly. Facial hair appeared to be untrimmed. Tired eyes. Things that aren't terribly rare these days. But what I did find interesting was his shirt. Black and maroon. A white name tag read Colin. It was all too familiar. He had to be an employee for somewhere I'd been before, but where? I guess that's what I wanted, though, he said, his voice getting shaky. To finally pay for what I've done. What are you talking about? What have you... I stopped my question partway through, due to a sudden jarring realization. So that's where I recognized the uniform from. The theater. The one where this shit show had started. I recalled the details of the investigation. A new employee, joined not too long ago. Now missing. It was him, wasn't it? Fucking bastard! I hardly controlled the words as they came out of my mouth. By all accounts, this guy was the reason Lacey was missing. I took everything out of me not to strangle him right there and then. Those urges were pushed even further when he chuckled. I see, he said. You're not the police. Someone looking for vengeance? It's not so good for me, but I suppose it's what I deserve. He sighed, putting the candle down at his feet illuminating a pile of empty soda cans and cellophane wrappers behind him. Go ahead, he said. I won't fight back. I took about a half a minute to calm myself down. It didn't quite work. I was still seething, my fists shaking like hell. If I were Mike, this guy's face would have been reduced to mush already. Luckily for him, I wasn't Mike. I suppose it was lucky for me as well. Beyond anything, I needed answers. I took a deep breath unclenched my fists, forcing my emotions to the curb. At least I tried. You're responsible for this, aren't you? You screamed that goddamn film? I could see the man's silhouette nod. I gulped down my anger. What the hell are you doing here? The man drooped his head. I can't go back into town. I'm not strong enough. Not man enough to face what I've done. A moment of silence followed. I could see him shaking ever so slightly. His breathing gradually became rapid and uneven, like he was like he was forcing down tears. 
A man, I said. Is that what you are? After doing what you did, I'm... I'm not so sure. That's the part you don't understand, he finally said. They'll force you to do things you never could have fathomed doing before. All without laying a single finger on you. I scoffed. What? You're scared of monsters under the bed? Yeah, he did that shit to me as well, but I didn't crack from it. Didn't have to take 12 people down with me either. Monsters? The man muttered. Yeah. Yeah, turning into monsters is one of his tricks. But nowhere near the worst one. I could feel the anger coming back. Look, if you couldn't handle it, maybe you should have just... I stopped myself from finishing the sentence. It was something I really didn't want to say, even given the circumstances. Just take my own life, right? He responded. Yeah, I guess I'd agree. I suppose it all started with me. I wasn't... I began, now at a sudden loss for words. I tried recomposing myself. Freaking out wasn't going to get me anywhere. What did you mean when you said that turning into monsters wasn't his worst trick? I meant what I said. He goes by trial and error, turns into things he thinks will evoke the most fear out of us. Horror movie villains, monsters from folklore. Those are good options. The simplest ones as well. But that won't work on everyone. It didn't work on me. I raised my eyebrow in the darkness. What? When he can't scare you by using such direct tactics, he tries harder. Digs deeper into the recesses of your mind. What would petrify you the most? Things that would drive you to the darkest corners of your own soul. You'll start to feel mad, just short of being catatonic. Cognizant enough to carry out his orders, but too, too constrained by visceral fear to do anything else. You'll feel nothing but emptiness. A cold void where your heart once was. Hopes, desires, any kind of positive emotion completely gone. You'll feel... You'll... You'll feel... Blank. He paused again. I may not be the strongest, but... I don't think even the strongest could cope with that. It took me a minute to think about what he just said. If he was right, then, well, well, that was bad news. My anger suddenly took a backseat to apprehension. He's chasing you right now, isn't he? Colin asked. Mr. Blank will probably kill me once he catches up. He has no use for me anymore, after all. He paused again, lighting a cigarette this time. It was frightening how devoid of emotion his tone was. But... I can't say that I would mind that. He took a long drag. Truly sorry for any grief I may have caused you, but there's nothing I can do anymore. Nothing we can do. I didn't want to accept it. Nothing. Like, we can't find a way to beat him somehow? Can't find a way to, to get those missing people back? He took another long drag. Unfortunately... What in the hell are you doing hiding in a cave? He was cut off by a familiar southern accent. I turned around seeing Jimmy and Sven standing at the mouth of the cave. Sven told me to follow his witch drawings. Led me to a yellow-bellied coward. The hell are you running away from the fight for? Jimmy said, clearly upset that I had gone ahead without him. I also noticed that his shotgun was over his shoulder, and not in his hands. The fuck are you doing? I asked. He's gonna... That weird son of a bitch ain't gonna do shit. Jimmy responded. Disappeared some time ago. Lost count of how many times I killed him. How many of my precious bullets I wasted on him. God damn it. Disappeared? I asked, perplexed. Yeah, Sven spoke up. It's been about eight minutes. Unless it's planning on a surprise attack, it looks like it's gone for now. Who the hell's behind you? I turned around seeing Colin now standing up, which startled me a bit. What do you mean it's gone? He said, something shocked at the prospect. The hell do you think we mean? It up and disappeared. Vamoosed. 
Maybe it got tired of being slaughtered. Who on God's green earth knows? Colin stepped forward, moving more into the daylight. As expected, he looked like hell. Smelled like it, too. I could see Jimmy and Sven physically react to his appearance. However, his eyes were different than I would have imagined. Not so hopeless like his words. In fact, in fact, they were brimming with determination. He grinned at me, if only slightly. We have a chance here. But we have to move quick. It's happened before. What has? I was having a hard time keeping up with Colin as he ran. For a guy that looked like the product of an apocalypse, he sure as hell was fast on his feet. Sven and Jimmy followed behind, shouting after him. Him disappearing. Southerner's right. When he bleeds over into our world, he tires himself out, especially if he keeps taking on different forms. What? How the hell do you know this? He suddenly stopped running, causing me to nearly crash into his back. I... He began. Before taking a deep breath. It's a long story. I have to explain quickly. As much as it scares me to admit, his story sounded eerily similar to mine. It all started with the incident years prior, the last time Mr. Blank had made an appearance when Sven's fiance had disappeared. Colin's brother had disappeared along with her. He was living halfway across the country when it happened, though. He had heard about his missing siblings and the obscure details that went along with it. He booked the first flight over and attempted to figure things out for himself. It went as you'd expect devoid of any trustworthy leads, lack of any real direction. It took him an entire week of relentless and dangerous searching to learn the name Mr. Blank, and that's where it all started going downhill for him. But even then, he didn't stop. Colin started getting visits from him the same way that I had. Just like he'd done with me, Mr. Blank's psychological torments started off fairly surface level. 80s movie villains, ghosts in the closet, creatures standing outside his window, etc. While they certainly took a toll on him at first, he endured, continuing his search in spite of all of it. He even tried attacking Mr. Blank directly, just as I had. Wouldn't work out so well, as he went on to learn. Maybe he was lying about it all. I don't know. But I could feel my anger towards him gradually fading as he relayed his story to me. He hadn't really done anything different than I had. Well, I guess he had. He did everything completely alone. I had Mike and Rose with me. After Colin had trudged through Mr. Blank's initial onslaught, the latter started pushing harder, trying to break him completely. This is where Colin's story truly began diverging from my own. Mr. Blank began using more... abstract tactics. For example, Colin came home once to find his father standing in the corner of his bedroom. His father had died some years prior. He didn't do anything, though. He just stood there with a blank expression like a mannequin, day and night, for nearly two weeks. On top of that, he'd get more and more frail by the hour, as if he was rapidly losing weight. By the end, he was essentially a skeleton. That resulted in the first bona fide mental breakdown of Colin's life. And of course, it wasn't even close to ending there. The psychological stress and torment he experienced sounded like enough to make... Well, anybody lose it completely. He'd seen faces of pure malice and hatred staring at him in the mirror. He'd see a bottomless pit in the middle of his living room, while hellish screams continued emanating from within it. Every time he'd open up a toilet, the face of his sister, drowned to death, would be staring up at him, gasping for air. And he couldn't bring himself to describe the worst of it, though. Just that his deepest, most visceral fears were manifesting in front of his very eyes. And it was breaking him minute by minute. It did reach a point where he attempted to kill himself. He walked onto his balcony in the middle of the night and looked over the railing from the 14th floor. He stared down at the ground with his mind running a mile a minute. But before he closed his eyes and took the plunge, he saw a figure with a blank face staring up at him from below. He said that he froze in that moment. While they stared at each other, he said that he was coming to an understanding. An implied agreement. Do what I want and I'll end this hell for you. He felt a transistory comfort, combined with a sensation of overwhelming coercion. In other words, he didn't have a choice in the matter. Not like I can explain it, he said. He was fucking with my head. Felt like I'd face something worse than death if I didn't play by his rules. If I didn't do what he said. 
Go ahead, think what you want about me, but... You weren't there. You couldn't have understood. Right, I said, trying to digest what I'd just been told. Do you still hate me? I sighed to myself. I don't know. Did I? Depends, I finally said. You said that we have a chance. What did you mean by that? He nodded. Yeah, we do. I can help you get her back. Everything just has to go right. My ears perked up. All right, go on then. We can defeat him, kill him. All we have to do is capture him on tape. I raised an eyebrow. That's it? Are you, are you kidding me? No, it's not what you think. What's been chasing you up until this point hasn't been Mr. Blank. Not his real form, anyway. That's what we need to capture. Don't ask me how it works, but he can't exist in two mediums or digital spaces at once. His real one weakens. The film that was shown when everybody went missing. That's the first one. Get him on tape with your own camera, and that'll be the second one. Well, how the hell are we supposed to see his true form? That's the hard part. He only sends out puppets when he crosses over into our world. In order to see him as he truly is, we have to enter his. Is that where... I began asking. He nodded. Yes. That's where your girlfriend is. How do we get there? Colin reached into his backpack and pulled out a film reel. Watching the film almost acts like a passageway between his world and ours. A more involved explanation really wasn't necessary. In fact, the whole situation began making a lot more sense. I used to ask myself why Mr. Blank chose our town. Why the hell he just had to come here? Well, the theater that it happened at was an older one. A classic place, so to speak. It was one of the few places that still used projectors. What's... What's it like in there? Colin shook his head. I couldn't tell you. But from what I've learned, the people trapped in his world are essentially being used as fuel. Mr. Blank feeds on inherent negative human emotion, anguish, uncertainty, d despair, fear. He doesn't kill them. He just keeps them there for himself. He keeps them in a constant state of terror. Must go catatonic after a few years in real time, but it hardly feels like a week for them while they're in there. And that's why he keeps coming back here for more. He'll never stop. Even if every theater stops using film. I'm sure that he'll find a way. He sighed. I'm not proud of what I've done. But if I'm going to do anything good with my life, it's stopping this fucker forever. If that was true, then Lacey was essentially in hell. She'd been in hell for weeks, but I suppose... I suppose it only felt like a few hours to her. How long do we have until he comes back and tries to kill us again? I can't give you an exact amount of time but I doubt we'll have more than a few hours. I took a deep breath as we reached the edge of the forest. Sven and Jimmy were close behind, catching up to us soon after. What in the hell are you two yammering on about? Jimmy asked. I turned and looked at him. Jimmy, we might need your help for a bit. Then I turned to Sven and grinned. Let's bury this bastard. My hands shook as I held the film reel. This is the source of it all, I thought. The reason Lacey went missing, the reason any of this shit had happened at all. As determined as I was to see this operation through, a lingering feeling of fear and hesitance never left my side. What's the film like, exactly? I asked. My voice shaking just a tad. 
Colin shook his head. I don't know. I'm not lucky I ever watched it. Can't really prepare you for much there. Sorry. That was more or less the response I was expecting. Colin sighed, starting to look anxious. We don't have time, though. He could come back at any moment. He looked at Jimmy. You still got ammo? Jimmy tapped at his belt proudly. Silly question. No monster's gonna get the jump on me. The haphazard plan that we formed went as follows. We'd rush over to the theater where everything had started. Since that was the only place we'd actually be able to play the film, since it was still likely being monitored by the police, we'd have to rely on Sven's FBI badge to dissolve that suspicion. According to Colin, if Mr. Blank's projection hadn't come back to attack us before we managed to enter the theater, it sure as hell was going to be there once we did. And of course, it was going to be aggressive. That's when Jimmy comes in. He's going to keep distracting it while Colin sets up the film. Once he did, Sven and I would be the ones to watch it. He wanted to save his wife. I wanted to save Lacey. None of us were backing down. Colin also gave us some very much needed details regarding the film itself, even though a lot of it was just speculation on his part. Supposedly, the film does something strange to the viewer's state of mind. The film exists in one plane of existence, Mr. Blank's. We exist in our own. So how does anybody traverse this gap and move from one to the other? Well, we could only really theorize there. Colin claimed it was about emotions. The range of human emotions are spectrum, obviously, but not a two-dimensional one. With happiness and sadness, distress and calm, pain and pleasure at their respective extremes, nearly every feeling spurred on by activities in our daily lives are different. Some are more similar to each other than others, but no two distinct feelings are truly identical. Even the same emotions that you perceive experiencing thousands of times over the course of your life is actually an entirely new experience each and every time. Now, I'm getting off track here, but look, emotions are complicated, and according to Colin's theory, they also act as a catalyst that could move conscious thoughts between different realities. If some kind of impulse evoked a strong and specific enough emotion, that could act as said catalyst. But if it were only their thoughts that had moved, then what the hell had happened to their bodies? That mystery remained. However, Colin was quite certain that the people who'd been transported were all still alive. Can't feed off a dead person's emotions, after all. There's something else you'd probably like to know, Colin said. Something really interesting. My ears perked up. I did know a few people that crossed over into Mr. Blank's realm, but managed to make it back out. They... They all told me that they felt themselves crossing over to a certain threshold of fear before they left our own world. However, they were still somewhat cognizant of what had happened. They knew that they were still in the theater. This wasn't the world that they belonged to. They weren't petrified to the point where they lost all sense of their past reality. Because of this, they always kept themselves grounded convincing themselves that none of it was real despite what Mr. Blank threw at them. Eventually, they got back using the sheer will out of their mind alone. I breathed a sigh of relief. At the moment, there was nothing that I needed to hear more. But you should also know that they all committed suicide within the next three months. Yeah, you, uh, you could have left that part out, I said. It's not going to be easy. But now that you know this going in, you'll have an advantage. Try and be ready for anything, because nothing's off the table here. With our asses on the clock, we began making our way to the theater. When we arrived, there was a single, bored-looking cop sitting in his vehicle near the entrance. He didn't ask questions when Sven flashed his badge. In fact, he looked pretty eager to leave. We didn't waste any time once we got in. Colin began setting up the film while I waited anxiously in the theater. We offered to help with the process, but he told us that we'd just slow him down. I wasn't going to argue with him there. I sat down in one of the seats, burying my hands into my face. I was nervous. There was no second guessing that fact. Can I even do this? I thought to myself. 
Fuck. I have to do this. I felt somebody put a hand on my lap. At first, I thought it was Fen trying to convince me, but then... Then I realized that didn't seem like something he would do. I'll be. Jimmy spoke up. Varma's back. Against my better judgment, I snapped my head to the side, staring at what appeared to be a mask composed of... a variety of segmented human faces. Don't move, kid! Jimmy's voice boomed from across the theater. Before I knew it, the ghoulish face was blown to the side, blood exploding from the other side of its temple. My ears were ringing from the shot as I looked towards Jimmy, who was holding some kind of oversized pistol. You're welcome, he smiled. Jeez, I muttered, still trying to regain my bearings. A few seconds later, I heard Sven cursing. I looked over, watching as a feral beast-looking creature grabbed him by the neck. Once again, Jimmy blasted it away. My brain rang some more. It looked like Mr. Blank had regained his stamina, and I sure as hell wasn't excited about that. Goddamn motherfucker! This time, Jimmy was the one cursing. Mr. Blank, now in the form of an oversized zombie wearing brass knuckles, it had gotten the jump on him, forcing him to resort to a fist fight. But he was holding up surprisingly well, dodging, parrying, countering each of the zombie strikes. Jimmy ended up pummeling it within a minute. How the hell... Where did you... I began asking, dumbfounded at his apparently vast array of combat skills. I fought in the evisceration matches on a planet you wouldn't dare step foot on, partner. I know my shit, he grinned. As if I was supposed to understand remotely what the hell he was talking about. I didn't have time to ask, though. I could hear something breathing down my neck once again. Come on, Colin, I thought to myself. Hurry the fuck up. And then it happened. The projector suddenly flicked on, and the breathing stopped. I scanned the theater, but Mr. Blank was nowhere to be seen. I locked eyes with Sven for a moment. This was it. This was the culmination of everything we'd been through. Well? Jimmy spoke up. Looks like this is it. I bid good luck to you both. Lights began to dim. I laughed to myself. Was that really necessary? The reaction was more of a coping mechanism than anything else. I was utterly frozen in terror. Sven and I were silent as we took our seats. For the first few seconds, I closed my eyes, afraid to open them even a little bit. But I knew that eventually I had to. So I did. And I cannot begin to describe what I saw in front of me. Before I divulge into what I saw in that theater, let's do a quick mental exercise. Hell. What does that word mean to you? More specifically, what do you visualize when you hear it? Put yourself in that environment right now. Are you walking through scorching flames while demons scream at you? A dark forest with thousands of beady eyes following your every move? Trapped underneath ice with something gnawing at your feet? Each one of us has an idea of what our own personal hell would look like. I found out what mine looked like in the theater. The film opened on a shot of a plain, abandoned city washed in dark blue. It was hard to tell what time of day it was. But the whole place just looked... depressing. After a few seconds, a figure came stumbling into the frame. A man wearing plain clothes with distorted facial features... His movements were desperate, stumbling through the empty streets in an ostensible attempt to evade something. I found out what he was running from only a few seconds later. It was another man, naked this time, with black, oozing sores covering his entire body. There was also a bloody, dirty bag tied around his head. His limbs twitched and contorted as he ran after the faceless man, letting out an unearthly, croaking scream as he moved. The faceless man was screaming as well, though his voice sounded all too human. He sounded... He sounded terrified. I'm not sure how long I was watching for, but it felt like hours. At a point, I even gave up on the objective at hand. I wanted to turn away from the screen so badly, however... However, I, I couldn't. My eyes stayed glued on the horrific scene in front of me. I couldn't move. I started wondering how Sven was holding up, watching something like this. It was only until later I realized we weren't even watching the same thing at all personal hells. Everybody's different. At a point, I started feeling strange. 
as if I couldn't distinguish real life from what was happening on the screen. My attention was fixated on the faceless man. Almost like I was seeing things through his perspective. Shit, I thought, before my mind drifted too far off to the deep end. I realized something extremely important at the very last moment. It's just a movie. A really disturbing fucking movie. The revelation came at the optimal time. I was already being sucked into Mr. Blank's realm. I could feel it. My physical self dissolving into an obscure void, yet... Yet I was cognizant of this fact. And while I was certainly scared, I was also determined. My vision went black for an unknown duration. When I opened them back up, my world was washed in a dark blue. I could feel goosebumps popping up on my skin. I was freezing, despite wearing a hoodie and jeans. There was also something behind me. I turned around, seeing the man with the bag over his head staggering towards me. It didn't take a genius to discern what had happened. I was now in the movie, not knowing exactly what to do, and fueled by sheer impulse, I began running through the empty streets. After the initial shock, I tried remembering what Colin had told me. I had to remember that none of this was real, despite how real it felt. But at the same time, how the hell was this not real? The cold wind bit at my face. My joints ached against the concrete below. I was even beginning to run out of breath. It felt real as hell. My mind started becoming frenetic. How the hell was this possible? Where the hell was I? I We never felt physical sensations in our dreams, so, so what was this? I turned around again, noticing the bag-headed man was getting closer, his inhuman shrieks sending shivers down my spine. I was starting to lose it, starting to lose my own sense of reality. The streets ahead of me were endless and unchanging, nowhere to go, nowhere to hide. I could hear myself beginning to whimper, utter terror overwhelming my senses, forcing me to abandon any previous thoughts, any connections that I had to the world that I belonged in. Was this the world I belonged in? How long had I been in here? Maybe this was all I knew. It was an unnerving sensation, and one that caused my eyes to begin watering. I was in hell. I mean, this was my existence. Cold, cold tears began streaming down my face. As I continued to run for this monstrosity behind me, I was beginning to forget where I'd even come from, and I was getting tired. I, I closed my eyes, preparing to give up entirely. Doing so hurt as tears began freezing up. But... But wait. That didn't make any sense. I remember reading about this once, about how tears would only freeze at below 40? And it sure as hell wasn't that cold. It was an utterly random fact, and one that I had no reason to keep being stored in my brain, but remembering it in that moment helped me more than I could ever know. If that part didn't make any sense, then what else was off about the situation? What was I doing here? I opened my eyes again, staring up at the sky. It was empty. No sun. No stars. No moon? No clouds? That... That wasn't right either. The buildings that surrounded me, I'd, I'd never seen a place like this before. I didn't belong here. This wasn't my world. This was... This was Mr. Blank's world. It, why, why had I come here? To save Lacey. None of this was real. I stopped in my tracks, catching my breath. I turned around, watching as the man behind me got slower and slower before stopping only a few feet away from me. He looked confused, as if he couldn't understand why I wasn't running. Why had I stopped? Because none of this was real. Why would I fear something that wasn't real? Hey, fuck face! I spoke up. Where the hell is Lacey? The man took a step back. Don't you fucking run, I said. Where the fuck is she? He started backing up faster. My grin grew wider. I'm gonna tear you apart with my bare fucking hands if you don't tell me. Suddenly, I wasn't so cold anymore. I could feel the adrenaline coursing through my veins. Where the fuck is she? And the voice was growing primal. My impulse was fueled by a culmination of all the fear and frustration that I'd been feeling up until this point. I got up to the bagged man relatively quickly, tackling him, then wrestling him down to the ground. I could feel his sores oozing all over me, which was quite the disgusting sensation, but forced myself to ignore it. Where is she? I screamed as I began strangling him. However, instead of gasping for air, the man simply began laughing. 
and of course he would. This was all a farce. What the hell? I screamed, grabbing the bag and ripping it from his face. What I found was a blank face staring back at me. You think I'm scared of you? A booming voice resonated throughout the space, coming from everywhere and nowhere at once, and suddenly the man began dissolving. Well, dissolving wasn't the right word. He was, he was morphing into thousands and thousands of insects. Horrified, I jumped back. I watched as the insects began crawling on top of each other, forming what appeared to be a humanoid torso on top of spider-like legs, and of course, there was a giant blank face at the very top of the abomination. Run, boy. The voice boomed again. Apparently, things weren't going to be so easy. How the hell was I supposed to win? I could feel the fear rushing back into my system. Mr. Blank had just been fucking with me the entire time. With no other options in sight, I did what he said, and I began running from the insect monstrosity. I looked over my shoulder every now and then, watching as the grotesque entity crawled towards me, knocking down buildings as it did so. But surely this thing was faster than me, I thought. Wait, of, of course it was. He never wanted to catch me, he just wanted me to keep running. Every trick he threw at me was an attempt to push me into a corner of fear I wouldn't be able to get away from. Fuck that. Fuck that, I was gonna hit back. As scared as I might have been, I was gonna have to force myself not to be. I skidded to a stop. I spotted a piece of wood off on the street and I picked it up before turning around and chucking it at the creature. I missed. But the message was sent. The insect creature, Mr. Blank himself, stopped in his tracks as well, seeming confused as to what to do next. I wasn't scared and Mr. Blank couldn't understand why. I mean, what is fear anyway? That's a dictionary definition, of course, but what evokes fear in one person and won't necessarily evoke it out of the next? At this point, Mr. Blank was trying too hard. He transformed again into an even bigger monster, resembling an amalgamation of black sludge, rotting corpses, writhing tendrils. Was it scary? I mean, maybe to a 14-year-old. After everything I'd seen, this only made me laugh. Laughing. Joy, mockery, every emotion that contrasted fear and despair, and that was the ultimate weapon against him. Suddenly, I remembered the plan. I, I reached into my pocket, and I pulled out my phone, and I... Got the camera ready, but unfortunately, Mr. Blank disappeared before I could start recording. Nevertheless, the tables had turned. Who was scared now? I wasn't exactly sure where to go, so I just picked a random direction and I began running. But... Something unexpected happened. The environment around me began to change. No more buildings, no longer washed in dark blue. I suddenly found myself standing in an endless field of yellow flowers. With a cloudless sky above. For a moment, I was absolutely jarred. What the hell had happened, I thought. Where'd I ended up? That answer soon became apparent when I looked down at the flowers. They weren't right, to say the least. They were blinking back at me. Some had mouths aligned with razor-like teeth, vigorously chomping away at the air. Some had their petals replaced with writhing fingers ending in claws. This was somebody else's hell. Or rather interesting one at that guess I'd better start running again I thought trying to be as careful as I could I began stepping over the ghastly flowers after a few minutes the environment changed again this time it was night and I was standing in front of a precarious looking rope bridge hanging over a deep cavern I was beginning to understand what was going on I suppose that I'd broken the system in a sense my own howl was no longer scary to me so I was free to roam through somebody else's everybody who had been trapped by Mr. Blank Light bulbs began to go off in my head. I remembered a conversation I had had with Lacey right after we'd gone through a haunted house on Halloween. It was a conversation about fear. What we were most afraid of. What I'm most afraid of, I remember her telling me. Okay, this is a weird one, but... Mazes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, imagine... Randomly being trapped in a maze and never being able to find your way out. Mazes. I knew what I had to look for now. I couldn't tell you how many different hells I ended up traversing. Probably upwards of 30. Maybe close to 40. They were all unique. All utterly horrifying in their own sense. But what was even more interesting were the people I met along the way. Out of all the hells I found myself in, I came across 14 people who were trapped in them. Nine were already catatonic. Two were hysterical and impossible to reason with. As for the other three, well, I don't want to give myself too much credit here, but 
I think I saved them. Not that it was easy. They weren't so willing to let things go. They truly thought that they were in hell, destined to live that way forever. They'd long forgotten about their past lives, who they were before, the time they'd spent in the theater before being transported to Mr. Blank's world. Trying to convince them otherwise was nothing short of a task, especially given the environment around us. But I wasn't scared. I had to prove it to them. Nothing was going to kill us. Nothing was going to hurt us if we didn't let it. By the time I'd found Lacey's hell, I had a grateful group of three by my side. Dash, a 21-year-old college kid, Nicole, 25-year-old computer programmer, and Roman, a 27-year-old soldier. We sure as hell had been through a lot together at that point. It started feeling like days had passed since I was in the theater, but my resolve never slipped. I was finding her no matter what. I nearly dropped my knees in relief when I found myself standing inside the labyrinth. It had all paid off in the end. The walls were about 15 feet high, covered in cracks and coated in moss. The ground was also comprised of cracked stone. There were torches set up every few feet or so, illuminating the place, but just barely. So I guess splitting up's probably not the best idea, Dash said. I wouldn't be scared if we did, though, Roman said, grinning at me. I'm not scared of a fake place like this. I smiled back. When I met him, he'd been petrified. As if he'd given up any kind of hope. But here he was now, ready to help me take down Mr. Blank and find Lacey. You're right, I responded. Nothing scary about this place. But Dash is also right. Better stick together. Everybody nodded and we began searching. About every ten turns we'd come across some kind of creature wandering through. They ranged from eyeless little girls to ghoul-looking things. But that wasn't a problem. We'd seen more frightening things than that. Once it was obvious that we weren't taking that fear bait, the creatures pretty much ignored us. I couldn't keep track of how many turns we took. Over a hundred, at least. It's pretty obvious why Lacey wasn't exactly a fan of these, but eventually... We came across something different. A set of stairs. Leading down into darkness. Unlike the creatures that posed a more uncertain threat, it evoked a fear of the unknown, making it exponentially more frightening than any of the corny monsters we'd encountered before. I could see the hesitation rising amongst our group, but that was to be expected. That's exactly what Mr. Blank wanted. For that reason, I didn't even think about it before descending the stairs, using my phone's flashlight to guide me along. It didn't matter if nobody followed. All that mattered was that I didn't let the fear stop me. To my surprise, I heard three sets of footsteps following behind me. I smiled to myself. That was it. The final stretch of all the madness I'd experienced so far. I'm not sure how far we'd walked. Not that it mattered. I'm sure everything in this world was nothing more than an illusion, even time. I had to tell myself that in order to deal with what we came across next. The stairs ended, leading to what appeared to be a bottomless void. Sounds emanated from below. They were obscure ones, things that I'd never heard before, leading to chills involuntarily crawling down my spine. Mr. Blank had certainly stepped his game up. No cheap scares here. What was presented in front of me petrified me to the bone. Once again, I could see hesitation amongst our group. What do you think's down there? Nicole asked. I paused for a moment, considering the question. Nothing. Nothing at all. I didn't let another thought cross my mind before jumping down. For the longest time, it felt like I was floating. If you ask me how long exactly, there's no way I could have told you. There was nothing around me, no sensation at all. I was in the void, and soon enough... Soon enough, I felt solid ground beneath my feet. I picked the direction I was already facing and began walking. Again, I had no sense of time. My mind began drifting with each step I took but I never let it get away from me completely. An indiscernible amount of time later, I found myself standing in front of a stone clearing with everybody else behind me. We were at the edge of the maze. I found what I was looking for. I let out a deep exhale, probably the deepest one of my life. Lacey. She was right in front of me, curled into a ball with her back against the stone wall. She was wearing what she typically did. Blue jeans and a green flannel shirt. Upon hearing my voice, she looked up at me, her eyes long red from what had been a constant stream of tears. 
She didn't look happy to see me, but I didn't expect her to be. She'd probably been given too much false hope in a place like this. You're not real, she whimpered, before beginning to cry again. Leave me alone. I approached her slowly. Lace. She looked back up. I was one of the few people who called her that. I'm one of the only real things in this entire place. I grabbed her hand. She pulled back a bit at first, but I didn't let go. I didn't force it either. You shouldn't be here. Let's get back to where we belong. Her skin was warm. So was mine. I saw a spark of understanding in her eyes, but before I could smile, a familiar presence made an appearance. A large shadow cast itself into the light of the torches. I looked up, seeing a tall, skeletal figure with a blank face leering down at us. Lacey flinched, but I just gripped her hand tighter. I looked up at Mr. Blank and shot him a self-satisfacting grin. There's nothing left for you to do here. A moment of silence followed as he continued leering. Do you consider this a victory? He asked. No, I began to respond. Not really. But you didn't win either. The whole time my hand had been slowly reaching into my pocket for my phone. I grabbed it and I opened the video camera, but it was too late. He disappeared in the blink of an eye. I grinned to myself. He's scared. I frightened the boogeyman. I looked back at Lacey, who looked equally confused and terrified, but a sense of reality had returned to her face. Before, it seemed as if she was in a trance, in the process of forgetting where she'd come from. Seth. Wait. She shook her head. How are you? Looks like she's back, Nicole said from behind me. You're pretty good at this, aren't you? I suppose I was. And who are... Lacey began before trailing off. There's a lot I have to explain, but not here. Right, Roman said. How are we getting back? I'm not sure how the answer to that question came to me. It was kind of just something I figured out along the way. What do you mean? I responded. We've been back the whole time. We never went anywhere. Don't you remember? It took a second. But Roman began to smile. We never left the theater, did we? I nodded. The other two soon followed suit. This is some Dorothy type shit, isn't it? Dash said, grinning as well. No fucking place like home. I looked back at Lacey. We were never here. Don't you remember? It took a moment. But she nodded. Yeah. She said, her lips curling into a slight grin. I think I'm starting to. Pretty soon after, I remember my vision going black. Well, I'd be lying if I said that I remember what happened at all. I just remember waking up back in the theater with the same time that I'd spent Mr. Blank's world still fresh in my mind. It didn't feel like a dream. And it wasn't one. I sat up rapidly, feeling a hand on my shoulder as I did so. I turned around, seeing Sven smiling at me. Finally back. Took you a while, he said. Sven, did you? He nodded. I found her. She's back. I looked around the room, but the only people there were Colin, Jimmy, and a few bewildered-looking police officers. Then where is she? I looked around some more. Wait, wh where's Lacey? My heart stopped for a moment. Uh, if you will, one of the cops spoke up. We might be able to shed some light on that. Apparently, the police had found the people who had gone missing in the theater in an abandoned warehouse three towns over. When they were first discovered, they were still unconscious, albeit alive. However, while they were being transported to the nearest hospital, two of them woke up. Two university students, a male and a female, whose names hadn't been released. Apparently, a dazed woman had also been found wandering through the woods in a different state as well. I had a good feeling on who they could be. So did Sven. And I was right. I hauled ass to the hospital immediately. The cops tried to stop me, but Sven flashed his badge again and got them off my case. He really was a good asset to have around. I looked through the windows of the rooms the discovered students were staying in. I don't think my smile has ever been wider. When I saw Lacey sitting up in her bed, alive and playing with her hands as she usually did, 
She looked a bit frail, but there was no doubt about it. She was smiling. She remembered everything. I left without saying anything to her. All that I needed to know was that she was alive. Our reunion would come later. For now, she needed to rest. On the way back, I learned how she ended up in the warehouse so far away to begin with. Apparently, Mr. Blank's influence was severe and far-reaching. He had a whole legion of fear-induced slaves doing his bidding in our world. Since he needed his victims to remain alive and undisturbed, he'd order people who'd been petrified into obeying him in the past, like Colin, to storm the theaters, quickly drag the bodies out, and then drive them off to a far remote location. Once there, they'd keep the physical bodies alive while their frightened minds remained trapped in Mr. Blank's world. This time, they even took it up a notch. They replaced the video surveillance with looped footage taken when the theater was empty, in order to confuse the investigators even more. It sure as hell worked. A foolproof system, right? Well, not really. Seven arrests were made that day. It'll be an interesting trial, for sure. Nevertheless, I can't say that I hate these people. I can't hate Colin, either. There's only one person I can direct my anger towards. And he's still alive out there. And I feel a lingering responsibility to rectify that. We'll see where this goes. I got a call from Jimmy a few hours ago. I told him about what I saw in the other dimension. About how I wanted to get rid of Mr. Blank once and for all. Got something you might be interested in, he told me. You see, this varmint apparently got a bounty on his head out there in the Cosmo. We can make a real killing if we reel him in. Got another buddy who's interested as well, name's Dex. Oh, but he's uh, got a weird arm, so don't freak out when you meet him. Freaky weird arm. <laughs> All right. Talk to you about the details later. Bye for now. Looks like the hunt might be back on. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and... It's the end of today's video, or today's episode of the podcast, which means I want to tell you guys, thank you so much for watching. And thank you for hitting like, and subscribe, and bell, and I think it's still subscribe on podcasts. One day I'll look that up. If you guys are listening on your phone, like I think the statistics say like 90% of you are, then on your phone you can also listen on another place. It's an app called Chilling. The Chilling app allows you to listen to stories from me, that you can't get here, as well as stories from a whole group of other narrators. A lot of them you've heard before. Some of them you've even heard here, like Autumn Ivy. Plus, it allows you to control the background music and background ambiance, which I think is probably one of the coolest features on there. Check out Chilling on Android and iOS now. I want to give a very big thank you to everybody on Patreon, especially Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Brian Arce, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Robert Schonkwiller, USMC, Matt Bach, Jables Raz, Mask Note, Joshua Mullen, Dan Pham, Matthew McNeese, Ben Spates, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Fikamal, Nana, The Morgan, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, Sky Mara Ravenswood, William King, Reaper 61167, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Isodo Hatred, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Parafa Panda, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, at Grizzly Olsen Pro, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Jay, Miss Alexandra, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Fried Chicken 12, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday, Jason Willis, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trey Smiles, and Corey Kenshin. Like I said, I, I cannot thank you guys enough for being a part of this, and that goes to everybody down there in the description, and everybody who even can just support for one dollar. Thank you guys, thank you guys, thank you guys. I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season, and sweet dreams.